memory stuck between the pages of my heart. Memories. I'm bringing up my friend in a minute. All right, now we're ready. Now I can bring him up. Memories. What's happening, friend? Hi there. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah, good, good. Yes, good. All right. Yes, hello there. Now, I want to thank this one particular Muslim troll, a demon. I learned by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ how to put on the slow mode on for our stream yard so that they can't just flood us and spam our text courtesy of a brother who sent me a video so brother we're going places so glory to god thank you again for being flexible to do this on a wednesday just let me let, it, let everyone know i've said that thursdays will be lloyd's day but when things come up we may have to change our schedule around and Tomorrow is going to be a busy day for me, running around to try to get a car, rent a car. So he was flexible, flexible enough and kind enough to do it Wednesday. So thank this brother for me. Pray for his ministry. Pray for his family. I gave you a link to his YouTube channel. Go there, support him, subscribe, watch, and contribute because he's doing fantastic work. So glory to Jesus Christ. May he fill you. And fill me with the same Holy Spirit to magnify Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And we have a special guest today. Guess who? AKQJ10. I haven't seen you in ages, sister. What happened? Miss me? All right. So you have a special guest just for you. She's here to see you. She doesn't come to my live stream. She'll come when someone else is on. <laughs> Brother, good to have you. Glory to Christ. Thank you, Sam. You can hear me okay? Beautiful. You're doing beautiful. You, you sound yeah, as beautiful. I'm on my. I'm not on my PC today. There's there, there's renovation here at home, so things look like it's a train wreck here. So I'm having to improvise. Well, I pray God will bless the internet for you, the connection, and you sound as beautiful as you look, Mister. Thank you. No, thank you, Sam. Yeah. So thank you everyone for being here, and uh, yeah. Uh, thank you again, Sam, for, for the very kind words, the support, and to your audience. Um, the support has been amazing. The, really, um, it's, been, it's been an incredible journey, so thank you very much. Glory to God, Father. All right, we got a good crowd. We have Ortho Christos. We have Ryan. He's related to Ryan Seacrest. Mimi and Bibi, she is Chaldean slash Assyrian. By the way, Chaldeans and Assyrians, not Syrians, are the same ethnic group, but the Chaldeans are haters. They like to call themselves Chaldeans. <laughs> Just kidding. I want to start trouble here. <laughs> I want to start a debate before we even started. Yeah. So, um, so it's been an interesting week. Um, yeah. So hopefully we'll have a few minutes after the after the session to chat, Sam. But um, yeah. So any any anything you want to mention before we we begin? No, well, I just want everyone to make sure you go back, rewatch the series. And if you want more up-to-date information, go to his YouTube channel. And Lloyd is also doing a painstaking research, not only to atheism, which God willing in time, I'd love him to come to my channel and do that. He's doing it for his channel. The Roots of Atheism, it's number one. Number two, he's now digging deep into the Protestant reformers, particularly Martin Luther. And I can say this, Protestants, I love you. The stuff he's finding is going to trouble you, especially about Martin Luther. And God willing, if you want to catch some of the material, go to his channel, because by the time he does it here, it'll be a while, because he's already way beyond this topic on his channel. So Protestants, remember, he's not an anti-Protestant or pro-Catholic. He's just studying the sources as objectively as possible and what he's finding will be troublesome am i correct um yeah look i mean i was raised in the anglican church uh, so so i myself i'm a protestant however i okay i'll try to be very quick so i encountered so many claims by protestants uh, against the catholic church which just like the claims against the Jews and the claims by Muslims, I went and researched and I, I inevitably came to discover that it's, it's either a misrepresentation or it's false. And what I'm finding is that, and is that there's a, 
the the narrative about the Protestants, there are aspects of it that are glossed over that, um, how can I say this? Okay, there was collaboration, and I don't mean on a casual basis. There was a collaboration, it seems, between Protestants and Muslims, between the Ottoman Turks. There was a certain, shall we say, religious affinity that was being discussed between them. Sad. And there was, let's say, direct military support and direct financial support. And in fact, there was an aiding and abetting of the invasion into Europe. And so there's, there's more to the story that, that the more I discovered, the more disturbed it makes me. Amen. And you're confirming the research. If you guys don't remember, go back, watch the sessions with Walid and Theodore Shobat. And I'll have them back on. I got to reach out to them. I haven't forgotten them. Pray for them. He's confirming the research of those two individuals, father and son, because they said the same thing. Did you hear what he just said? That the Protestants were receiving financial support from the Ottoman Turks and their hatred of the Catholic Church and aiding and abetting the Ottoman Turks' attack on the Catholic Church. May God have mercy. How could they even think about being in bed with Muslims over against a group that worships and loves the triune God. Wicked, filthy, and satanic. May God have mercy. Now, brother, the floor is yours. I know um, you're busy yeah. up, but it's yours. And I'm sorry, he's renovating. So he's also <clears throat> under a lot of stress in that his house is being renovated. He's got to move his internet, his computers. So this is very kind of him to take time out of his busy schedule and be flexible enough to come and serve us so we can show him support by praying for him, going to his channel, subscribing, and supporting him as well financially for the glory of Jesus Christ. So give him a few seconds. Good to see no, some of you. Some of the older folks are back here for the first time, like my sister, AKQGBLSNP. I haven't seen her in ages. She's just the hater. She comes when she wants, and disappears when she wants and ignores me when she wants. That's the story of my life. Story of my life. All right. Sorry, brother. I'm just in the mood to be silly today, you know, because I, I have a long walk tomorrow, as you know, behind the scenes. Tomorrow, I'm going to probably be walking about 10 miles to get to my destination to get my car for my trip this weekend. If God wills, pray for me. I'm going away for a weekend. Even in my hotel room, Lord willing, I'll try to do some live stream if the Lord wills. So, How's everybody doing? Yeah. Blessing to all my Samunian family. Who's Samun, Mimi? My name is not Samun. Sounds like baboon. I'm Shamun. All right. All right, brother. So yeah. you guys excited? He's going to give you further proof, as if he hasn't already established the thesis. Allah of Islam is none other than the moon god, Hubal, 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 Baal, Baal. So Islam is a form of Baalism. Repackage and Baal is the name of Satan, and that is the root of Islam. May the Lord Jesus destroy Islam. May the Lord Jesus erase the name of Muhammad. May the Lord Jesus destroy the Quran. May the Lord Jesus save the Muslims. We want Muslims to come to know Jesus Christ, and millions are. And may the Lord Jesus give the jihadis, the terrorists, what they deserve if they don't repent and keep his church safe and secure from their onslaught. And may the Lord Jesus fill us with the Holy Spirit to be bold lions and lionesses in love with Jesus Christ, even unto death, and never back down and never betray the Lord Jesus, trusting the Spirit to seal us for the glory of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm Baba, huh? Okay, Baratha. All right. She's making me feel old. She's calling me Baba. Baba means that. So I don't know if that means, I, you know, she thinks I'm too old because I'm 50 going on to 51, but I don't look a day over 30. All right, brother. Poor guys. Okay, like yeah. You yeah, so anyway, the, the controversial issues we'll tackle another time um, as I start to discuss more about Martin Luther um, because there are some serious issues in his life that need to be discussed. And um, it's upsetting, but it, it, the thing is, it's upsetting me too as I discover but, this. And, so you're, you're just going where the facts will lead you and may God give us the power to accept the facts as they are and correct yeah. ourselves from mistaken. Yeah, so, I'll provide, let me provide a very short thesis right now. When you look at Martin Luther's life, you find that there's a huge amount of apologetics around it. The, the, the narrative, the academic narrative, the standard narrative around it is very defensive. It glosses over a lot of issues. 
So I haven't been wanting to look at it from a standard perspective because it, it kind of focuses you into an area where there's already this very strong defense, like a minefield. So ask yourself the question, sola scriptura, where does that come from? Who had that idea before Luther? So when you start looking, you'll find a, whole, a long list of names, but let's say you get to the first few people that, that come up. Every single one of them is either, well, every single one of them is effectively a heretic, known to be one historically. Two, they are theocratic. They had very deep, shall we say, political aims. And or they were Gnostics or mystics or some other crazy person. And then you start to find that these ideas started with people that, that clearly were not of good intentions, clearly people that had an agenda. So this idea was simply packaged, named very nicely, solo scriptura, but the idea is not a new one. The idea is an old one. And it's it's not a, not necessarily a good idea. So you start looking at the history. Where did this idea come from? Who had it before? And you start finding a list of people that, that you probably don't want to invite over for lunch. Right? Wow. And it just doesn't look so good. And you start looking at, at where this leads and you start looking at the Protestant links to, shall we say, Middle Ages Chrislam, the funding given by the Ottomans to the Protestants and the, the rise of the Unitarian Church as a Protestant movement. That's the anti-Trinitarian Church as a Protestant movement. Yeah. Then from that, some extreme heresies that, for instance, one heresy that said we need to remove the name of Jesus from the service, from the church, from the mass. We do not speak Jesus's name in church because this offends the Muslims. You can't have that. Any doctrine in Christianity that disagrees with Islam needs to be removed because any disagreements between Islam and Christianity is false. Therefore, anything in Christianity that contravenes Islam and would, would, would not allow for a perfect merging between them has to go. This, this comes out of the Protestant movement. So there are issues there that, that need to be discussed. Glory to God. May the Lord empower you to do meticulous research, factually sound that can't be refuted. I'm excited. You're already doing it on your channel, and please come and do it on this channel. You have a platform here as long as the Lord gives me breath and to do ministry, and we do it in integrity. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. You saw the rotten fruits of Protestantism in bed with Islam. That's why Jamal Muhammad White bends over backwards to appease Muslims, but he will bash fellow Christians, particularly Catholics. You see the pattern because it's the same spirit. May God purge the church of this spirit for the glory of Father, Son, and Spirit. So, so look, it's early days, but I will be talking about this in the future. So I'm busy collecting information on that. So anyway, there's so many things to discuss. Let's get into monotheism. Okay, so let's try and finish this today. We discussed the Yemeni Hadith previously. And of course, we spoke of Da'if Bukhari and Da'if Muslim and other sources that show just how important Yemen is to Islam, which is very, very interesting. And Muhammad states very bluntly that the faith of the Muslims, the, the creed of the Muslims, the Aqidah and the Iman come from Yemen. He doesn't say it comes from Mecca. He says, no, it comes from Yemen. What came from Yemen? Well, Sabaean moon worship. Okay. And then, of course, we've got this confirmation by Ibn Taymiyyah that it is only permissible to touch and kiss the two Yemeni stones. Uh, while we are at that, maybe I need to bring up something else. So let me go here. Okay, this might actually be important. So, so let me... Islam, and I need to... Oh, great, when this doesn't work. Okay, so we'll be bringing up something very briefly about the Kaaba. Um, okay, but let's continue here, right? Okay, so I want to show this first. I covered this slide last week, but I realized I did not do a proper job about this. Now, I will state that I have seen Protestants, Christians, within the comments and within chat and so on saying, oh, Mary is also a pagan because Mary is associated with the moon because Mary is a moon worshiper. The Catholic Church is pagan. I'd like to say that that is very, very stupid. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, so here you've got Mary and here she is stepping on the moon symbol. Okay. This is Mary stepping on Satan's symbol, the moon. She is stepping on it, putting it under her feet, the way Jesus stepped on the head of the snake. Right. Do you understand? that there is stepping on the snake, destroying it, stepping on it because it is unclean. So you are stepping on it out of disrespect. Notice this symbol here. This is the moon god Shin. This is the symbol of the moon god Shin, the crescent. This is a mosque with exactly the same symbol. Notice the symbol here. Notice the symbol here, the moon god Shin, right? This is a Muslim mosque with the symbol of the moon god Shin. It is the same as the pagan symbol at left, okay? Nice. Notice this is an Ottoman Turk. Okay, he has a sword here. Ottoman Turk has a sword. 
Notice he has the crescent moon in his left hand. That's a woman, okay? Notice the moon symbol, the moon pouch on her belt. This is the face of the moon. Notice here, the foot stepping on the world, right? That's the globe, the earth, the foot stepping on the globe. And notice here, she is stepping on the cross. Wow. Okay? So wow. if Mary stepping on the moon makes her a Satan worshiper, then this, this Muslim stepping on the cross makes them an Orthodox Christian. No, sorry, a Baptist. Sorry, my bad. Oh, my yeah. bad. Uh, Lutheran. <laughs> Lutheran, yes. It makes her the sister of Martin, maybe his cousin. So if, a, if, if an Ottoman steps on the cross, this makes them a Lutheran or a Calvinist. Understand? So, so please think through your history. Do some research. Wow. Don't follow the propaganda. Understand? This is an old symbol of Mary. There are many of them. This is Mary stepping on Satan, and this is an Ottoman doing the same. This, there's symbolic meaning here, and it's not the, 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 it's not the low IQ one that you have. Yep. And the imagery of the moon under Mary's feet is taken directly from Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. For those of you who know, you know, know your Bible, this is where it's derived from. Even if you want to say the woman is not the Blessed Mother, Revelation 12, 1, which is an explanation of Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, verses 9 to 11. Revelation 12, 1, for those of you who don't know your Bible, though you claim to be Protestants, and a great port and a sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. Now look at the image of Mary right there. Do you see the sun behind her and stars all around her head and the moon under her feet? This is a deliberate depiction of Revelation 12, verse 1. It comes from the Bible. It doesn't come from paganism, you Bible butchers. But I want you to see this point, and I'll try not to chime in too much. Now look at the image to your right. Well, it's to my right. You see that Ottoman Turkish woman? She has the cross under her feet, meaning crushing and conquering Christianity, and the crescent moon in her left hand. That's pagan. That's satanic. No, go ahead, brother. Yes. Also, it should be noted, Martin Luther wanted to remove four books from the Bible. Now, people say, well, I've, I've looked at my Bible today, and it's, 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 very, it's, it's, it's normal, like, like, like the regular Bible. Okay, we're talking 500 years ago. Martin Luther, in his Bible, in his translation, moved four books of the Bible, Revelation being one, James being another, to the back of the Bible into an appendix, because he didn't like those books, because according to Martin Luther, they disagreed with his theology. Right, so the Bible did not agree with Martin Luther's ideas, so the Bible had to be changed. Martin Luther not only wanted to move books to the back of the Bible and hopefully completely forgotten, he actually started to edit Bible verses too. But it's okay to edit the Bible if the Bible disagrees with you. That's normal, right, Sam? Exactly, because remember, Martin Luther is a gift to the church and you need to wake up and it has nothing to do with Islam. And the sooner you get that, the better off you'll be. So go ahead, brother. Okay, so Revelation was one of the books he wanted to remove from the Bible, so who knows. Okay, moving on. So uh, let's continue. So now I want to talk about, okay, without going into a long story, Monday is the day of the moon, okay, moon day. Monday, moon day, it's the day of the moon. It is the day of the moon in numerous cultures, including Arabic culture, okay? It's a standard thing. Monday is the day of the moon. So let's go to this Muslim website that tells us here, the Messenger of Allah said the gates of paradise are flung open on Monday and Thursday, Tirmidhi. And Monday is given such incredible importance in the heavens, it is only right that we give it equal importance here on earth. The day of the moon must be given incredible importance to Mondays. Okay, let's continue. So, uh, actually, hold on, let me go. Okay, so Abu Qatada Ansari reported that Allah's message was asked about fasting on Monday. And he said, it is the day when I was born and the day when revelation was sent down to me. So Muhammad was born on a Monday and revelation was sent down on a Monday. Monday, the day of the moon, which has nothing to do with the moon. And that's in Da'if Muslim, book 13, Hadith 265, right? And book 6, Hadith 2606. Let's continue. Sometimes, okay, I'll skip all this stuff, but it's just basically Monday is the day of the moon, okay? Muslims are encouraged to fast on Mondays. And Muhammad fasted on Mondays too. And Monday, the 21st of Ramadan before sunrise, when Muhammad is 40 years old, okay, he was uh, he received revelation. The black stone was placed in the Kaaba on a Monday. The mirage was on a Monday. Let's have a look at this article about the virtues of Mondays. So this is on a Muslim website called MuslimHands.org.uk. They're a charity website. 11 virtues of Mondays that Muslims need to know. 
Okay, we will discuss in this article the divine connections with Monday, including momentous occasions in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, which took place on a Monday. Allah created trees on a Monday. Now remember, trees were pagan. Abraham was told to cut down trees and Elijah was told to cut down trees that the pagans worshipped. And in fact, he worshipped the trees, right? He was a tree worshipper and he was told that has to go. So now why are they making a big deal here about trees? Allah created trees on a Monday. That's a very odd point. Okay. The gates of paradise are flung open when Ramadan begins. Did you know they are also opened every single Monday? Excellent. Allah opens those gates on a Monday. Right? <clears throat> Monday is given such incredible importance in the heavens. It is only right that we give Monday equal importance on earth. Mondays and Thursdays are incredible opportunities to have our sins forgiven. O Messenger of Allah, you surely fast on Mondays. Indeed, on Mondays. Allah forgives every Muslim as long as you, you know, do forgiveness on a Monday. This Monday, take time to reconcile your differences. Deeds are presented to Allah on a Monday. Okay, Allah forgives Muslims on these days. Our deeds are presented and accounted for by Allah on Monday and Thursday. Okay, the Prophet was born on a Monday. He was born on a Monday. Allah chose Mondays for the blessings, and naturally the Prophet also singled out Mondays. Okay, he raised the black stone to the Kaaba on a, guess, guess, take a wild guess, Sam, which day? Thor's day? Wodens no, one day? One day, one day. Moon day. <laughs> okay. like Monday. I wish it was a this Sunday. This famous... Event took place on a Monday. Muhammad received revelation on a Monday. Okay, when he was 40 years old. 40 is a magical number. Okay, there's a specific reason that, that even Khadija was 40 years old because the Muslims don't even believe that story. They say she was 25 because how could she have six kids when she was 40 years old in the desert? The Quran was revealed on a Monday. Okay, and they speak of Laylat al Khadr. Remember Laylat Lilith. Okay. Right, they say here, Monday could be the day you remember Allah's favor and the ascension, the mirage, took place on a Monday. The, the Messenger of Allah was born on a Monday. He was ascended to the sky on a Monday. He got revelation on a Monday. The Prophet's Hijrah began on a Monday. He arrived in Medina on a Monday. Hold on, he said he left Mecca on a Monday, he arrived in Medina on a Monday. He arrived in Medina on a Monday. The, he passed away. Oh, Muhammad died on a Monday, and it was Monday when he died. And we have a newfound love, a newfound reverence, and a new respect for Mondays. A practical way to give Mondays their due status is to increase your good deeds on a Monday. Sam, your thoughts about Mondays? I'll never view Monday the same again, and I'll never feel right mentioning the term Monday ever again after the avalanche of Mondays that you just presented. Now, you've made me hate Monday. It's now my least favorite day of the week. So I appreciate you, Lloyd, for doing that, but it has nothing new with Islam. Yeah, it's just another manic Monday, you know. So understand, so there's a huge religious attachment to Monday and a huge symbolic meaning to Monday in Islam, which is the day of the moon, right? This is Al-Abiyad, Lord of Monday and the moon. So Murah Al-Abiyad, Jinn, King of Monday and of the moon, right? He's the white one, the father of the light. He is also Abd Al-Nur, Ab Abu Al-Nur, Abu Al-Nur, that's Nur, the moonlight, okay? Or Mara, the white king, the Malik Al-Abiyad is the Lord of Monday and the moon. The moon, Kumar, Kamar, Kumar, right? We've spoken of that. That's the that's the full moon, right? It's reported from Atta that Ibn Abbas said a devil called Al-Abiyad came to the prophet Muhammad in the form of Gabriel, in the form of Jibril, and he cast these words, the satanic verses upon him, and the prophet recited them. This jinn is said to be the closest one to Satan in his court. So this jinn, the, the Lord of Monday, cast the satanic verses upon Muhammad and he had Muhammad recite the satanic verses according to Ibn Abbas. Now I'd hate to call Ibn Abbas a liar. Your thoughts, Sam? Yeah, actually, guys, I mentioned this in the previous session. I have an article where I actually quote the Muslim sources that say al Abiyat was the shaitan, just to give you a little background about what Islam teaches, because uh, Lloyd already knows this thoroughly. Some of you do, some of you may not know this. Let me just add one clarification. In Islam, you have created beings called jinn or jan. In English, they're called genies. Keep this in mind. What you call genies, 
the Muslims call jinn or jan, and they're actually a group of spirit creatures created from smokeless fire. According to Islam, the jinn are like humans in that, in that they can choose to follow Allah or choose to rebel against Allah. So among the jinn, you have these evil jinn who oppose Allah, and they're called the shayateen, the demons, the devils. Satan was a genie, a jinn, according to chapter 18, verse 50 of the Quran. So in Islam, genies are real. This is why if you ever watch anything associated with genies, they are just as Arabs, like genie in the bottle, I dream of genie, because it comes from Arabic Islam, Arabic folklore, paganism. Now here, according to the Muslim sources, and I'm going to give you my article, one of these demons, these genies who are demons, would appear to Muhammad as Gabriel. His name is Al-Abyad, the white one, as he was telling you. The Muslim sources say this was the genie that would deceive Muhammad because he would come and appear as Gabriel to him. And Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between al Abiyad and the real Gabriel. Talk about a wickedly stupid satanic religion. But not new with Islam, brother. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> so let's continue. Um, okay. Now, so now, of course, now that you know about al Abiyad, you obviously want to conjure him. You want to actually make him appear before you, don't you? So this nice Muslim man was nice enough to give us the invocation here, how to call up al Abiyad. You have to fast for 40 days. Then for the sheikh of God, for the sheikh of Allah, <laughs> whatever, you must abstain from all meat products. You must recite the conjuration 100 times. You must recite the, the Quranic Surah Al-Jinn three times. And then on the last day, you recite the conjuration with the incense until al Abiyad visits you with his army and the King Abiyad will assist all your needs after making an agreement with you. So according to this Muslim, you can call him up and he'll help you out. You can invoke him so you can cast spells to make him arrive and help you out. So, so yeah, which is nothing to do with Islam, obviously. This is nothing to do with Arabic and this is nothing to do with Islam, right? The Quran has nothing to do with Islam, the Surah Al-Jinn. So fortunately, yeah, luckily that's got nothing to do with Islam. Any thoughts, Sam, before I go on? Nothing to do with Islam. Okay, right. Now, al Makkah. Let's go to the Encyclopedia of Spirits. He is Lord of the Horned Goats. He is Lord of the Ibexes, the Horned Goats. Okay, the Horned Goat, well, I mean, that's a satanic symbol, but fine. He's also known as, amongst other names, il Muqqa, il Muk, il Umku, and also Allah. His origin is Sabaean, Yemeni. Okay. al Makkah appears to, be, to have been the preeminent deity of South Arabian Kingdom of Sabah. Now in modern Yemen, he was venerated in what is also Eritrea. The Sabaeans called themselves al Makkah's children. Sabaean inscriptions invoking him date from the 7th century BC. The great temple of Marib in Yemen is sometimes called the 8th wonder of the ancient world. Now, they wouldn't have called it the 8th wonder of the ancient world for nothing. It was dedicated to him. He had dominion over rain. He controlled storms, rain, and flooding. He's the guardian of irrigation, crucial to a desert nation. You can see here his symbol is the crescent moon and the star, as you can see here. His planet is the moon. His sacred animals are the bull the goat, and the ibex. The ibex is up here. His emblem is represented by a geometric image of a circle rising above a crescent, usually interpreted as a sun over the crescent moon. It could also be a full moon within cattle horns, similar to the crowns of Hathor and Isis, Egyptian gods, right? There's a story there with Hathor, but yeah, okay? So they, that's a little bit more about him historically. So <clears throat> let's have a look at the same symbols here. And of course, we learn that no ancient Arabian religious texts have been recovered. Little is known of the development of ancient Arabian religion because it's very, very interesting that somehow there's nothing. It seems that Arabia succeeded in withstanding changes more stubbornly than other parts of the ancient world with similar beliefs, which is not surprising because it was so isolated. Okay, after the fall of the Neo Babylonian Empire, Okay, a solar theology began to replace the lunar religion in many countries, except, of course, in Arabia, because the moon god remained supreme in Arabia, right? And, of course, the most widespread symbol of this religion of sky gods was the ancient Babylonian symbol of the sun disk in the crescent of the moon. In other words, a combination of the sky of the day 
and the sky of the night, the entire circle of heaven, as Herodotus calls it when speaking of the religion of the Persians. The Persians are the Zoroastrians. Now, of course, you saw recently that um, Shabir Ali put out a video talking about um, there's no reason why Muslims would be concerned that Muslims pray five times a day and that the Persians prayed five times a day because it's obvious that 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 Zoroaster was a prophet of Allah. Fine and well. So now you've got a link to this paganism, Babylonianism, you've got Zoroastrianism and Islam, which is like all the same symbol. That, <clears throat> well, that's fascinating, okay, that it has the same symbol as these previous pagan religions. And of course, we've got here in Sahih Bukhari, sorry, Da'if Bukhari, the military expeditions led by the prophet and the delegation of Banu Hanif, and it says, we used to worship, it says here, we used to worship stones. And we, when we found a better stone than the first one, a rock, a rock, we would throw away the first one and take the new stone. So accordingly, according to Sahih Bukhari, okay, the Muslims used to worship stones in the time of the Prophet. That's crazy. Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, I'll just continue then. Saying, so, just Sam, yeah, go on. Verse, guys, yeah. chapter 38, verse 5 of the Quran. Someone noticed that Islam is simply a hodgepodge of all these ancient pagan myths, fairy tales, <clears throat> it's occultism, witchcraft, Satanism, all combined in one. Here, that was the accusation against Muhammad. Here it is, chapter 38, verse 5. Even Muhammad's contemporaries saw he was taking all these gods and making them one. Chapter 38, verse 5. Has he made the Aliha? Gods all into one ilah? Clearly, this is a curious thing. So you're making all the gods one, Muhammad? Exactly. They notice that's what he's doing because he's inspired by Satan to take all these ancient pagan rituals and myths and gods and goddesses and Baalism and combine it into one. May the Lord Jesus destroy Islam completely. But go ahead, brother. Yeah, I'm actually, you know what? I want to do something, but uh, for some reason, my app, I want to show you guys something, but I will in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> let me... Let me close this, and then I will open it later and show you guys something to do with the Kaaba. Okay, but for now, let me just continue. So now let's have a let's have a look at the Kaaba. Okay, this is the Kaaba. You have pagan pillars and crescent moon. So remember, we had these three pillars. These are three pillars inside the Kaaba. We showed you the coins of Al Makkah, and Al Makkah has three pillars on his head. Okay, now this here, this is the Kaaba. You've got. This supposedly, this gold and black, this supposedly represents the stars in the Milky Way. And this black is the black of the Milky Way, right? So this is one of the symbolic meanings of this. But notice also, if Allah is a male, why is Allah dressed in a niqab, right? Why is he dressed in black and not dressed as a male, in white, right? So first of all, Allah is dressed in black, which is very, very odd. And two, this is the Milky Way, the stars, and of course, the black of night, which makes this an astrological symbol. This is the Hatim, right? This is a little wall. And these are the lamps here. These are the stars. This is the Kaaba from on top. You see the Hatim with the lamps lit, the stars, the moon, and of course, whatever this is, right? The Kaaba, the square in the middle. You can see here the coin with the three pillars on top. This is our Makkah, three pillars. You can see inside the Kaaba, three pillars. Can I, Lloyd, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Why did you put a picture of your toilet in the bottom right corner? We didn't. We need to see your toilet. What's why? If I wanted to see my toilet, take a picture of my toilet. Why do you got a picture of your toilet here, sir? Because some things just need to be flushed, and I'm trying to remind people you need to flush this. And how many times do we have to flush before Islam goes away? <laughs> okay, right. So let me just see here. Right. Actually, you know what? Yeah. So there we go. So understand this is a close-up view here, as you can see, of the three pillars inside the cover. Okay, now let's have a look here. This is, of course, the standard shot of the stars, you know, going around because the Earth rotates on its axis. So this is like a shot here. You can see this is like the center of the Milky Way. That's like Venus or, you know, whatever the, this, right? This is the pole star Polaris. And of course, the stars going around the Milky Way. This look at the symbolism here, right? Look at this symbolism here. People going around the fixed point, the, the abode of Allah on Earth. As above, so below, right? As in heaven, so on earth. As on earth, so in heaven, all right? So now you've got that. So you've got the moon that's fixed over there. You've got this point that's fixed. 
Let's continue. Here you've got the moon. Here you've got the sun disk, this big disk around here. You can see this is the sun disk here. This, this is either like Sirius or it is Polaris, the fixed star, or it is Canopus, and maybe also it is Saturn. Right? But this point is an important fixed point, right? the home of Allah on Earth. Let's continue. So this is an astrological symbolism. This is an astrological symbol based on the astrological religions. Like you have at Stonehenge, those were astrological symbols. Let's continue. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll just briefly run through this. This is not prepared yet, but there is Maimun, the Jinn King of Saturday and Saturn. His color is black and is a winged Jinn. <clears throat> okay. And also in Arabian mythology, he's a chieftain of the jinn who rules over Saturday, the day of Saturn. Okay. And he's the chief offspring of the goddess Zuhal. Okay. Also, some will say the god Zuhal and the goddess Zahra. Okay. The female form of Zuhal. Now, we've mentioned though, what I will mention though is that he's also, okay, the king of Saturday, the day of Saturn, Zuhal. And his color is the color black and the metal gold. <coughs> Sorry. All this construction, there's a lot of dust and concrete here. So, okay, so understand. So, another odd, weird thing is that you've got this idea of the Kaaba with the gold and black, which is also potentially associated with a symbolic deity, Saturn, who was also Marduk before, associated with gold and black. Okay? So, that's not a major link. I'm just mentioning that as just, as just something to be aware of. Now, there's a golden rain spout in the Kaaba, okay? When even with the rain spout at the top of the Kaaba, one says, give me to drink from the cup of your prophet Muhammad, after which I will never thirst. So does that sound a little biblical, Sam? So you have this hadith, give me to drink from the cup of your prophet, after which I will never... Because when you do the hajj, you know, hmm. when you walk around the I, I wonder, is that... The Gospel of John, Jesus Christ our Lord, in John 4, verse 10, verses 13 and 14, John 7, 38 to 39, John 6, 35, 36, Revelation 20 to 17. No, nothing to do with the Bible, nothing with plagiarizing the words of Jesus Christ and stealing the words of the Lord to make Muhammad another Christ, an antichrist to replace the true Christ. Nothing at all. You're just yep. seeing too much. Yeah, and of course, notice here, you've got in the life of Muhammad, the prophet by Sayyid, 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 Akhtar Rizvi, you've got Mo Potter, okay? And of course, it says here, this is entering the Masjid al-Haram. The holy prophet started breaking and demolishing the idols. There were 360 idols fixed in the walls and on the roof of the Kaaba. Any idol near which the prophet went and towards which he pointed his cane. So Muhammad pointed his wand. And he said, right has come and falsehood has vanished. Verily, falsehood is destined to vanish. It is Quran 1781. And the idol would fall headlong on the ground with no one touching it. So Muhammad would use his cane to do magic, to destroy. And that's how he destroyed all the idols in the Kaaba. That's in the very famous, very popular book of Sira, Muhammad's biographies. right? The Gospels of Muhammad. <clears throat> so yeah, Harry Potter. Muhammad is also Harry Potter. Just thought you guys would be interested. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Kaaba. So the Kaaba is a cubical structure at the center of the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. The Bakara verse, the cow, established the Bakara verse. Oh, the cow, the cow, the cow with horns, bull's horns. Established the Kaaba as the direction towards which Muslims must give their five daily prayers. Okay, and also destination of the Hajj, where they circle the, Quran, the Kaaba seven times and they kiss and they touch the black stone. Right, and it is roughly aligned north, south, east, west. Now, it predates Islam. It is claimed to have been first built by Abraham and his son Ishmael, and or maybe by Adam, although there are no archaeological findings to support this argument whatsoever. <clears throat> okay, the pre Islamic Kaaba was rebuilt several times with the tribes ruling Mecca who used it to house sacred objects, including the black stone. During the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad, the Quraysh tribe rebuilt the Kaaba with alternating courses of stone and wood, which, oddly enough, is exactly how the Ethiopians built their churches. Right? So the architecture at one point was exactly the way that Ethiopians built churches. The inner space was divided into two rooms, one of which housed the black stone, and the interior walls were covered with paintings of Abraham, Mary, Jesus, angels, prophets, and trees. 
trees again, back to trees, trees which Abraham was not to worship. But we know that historically, according to Islamic sources, the interior walls were painted with Mary and Jesus and angels. <clears throat> the exterior was covered with the Habarat cloth from Yemen. Not from Mecca, a cloth from Yemen. <coughs> okay, so, so anyway, so Caliph Abdul Malik demolished the Kaaba and he rebuilt it, okay, in 692, based on the Qureshi version. So there was a different Kaaba, they destroyed it, they rebuilt it. Okay, it was set on fire and so on. The Abbasid Caliphs contributed to the design of the Kaaba by covering it with the Kiswa. The Kiswa is a black cloth brought from Tanis in Egypt. So you had the cloth originally from Yemen, and then they brought a cloth from Egypt. Okay, let's have a look at this. Now have a look here. The Muslims, if you go online and start looking at the moon in the Kaaba, looking for photographs, you will find lots of exciting pictures where people are breathless about, oh, the moon is above the Kaaba, oh, the moon's... Why are they so concerned of showing that the moon is literally directly above the Kaaba? Does that have anything to do with the moon, Sam? Nothing to do with moon worship or Islam. You're a pagan. You're making stuff up as you go along. But I'll let you slide this time. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, so um, yeah. And notice, this is the glorious Kaaba here when the wind has blown the... Uh, this reminds me of St. Peter's in Rome where it reminds me of... You know, just just the Colosseum. This is, I, I don't know, man. How can people compete? How can people compete with this beauty, with this glory, with this amazing architecture? Sam, does this make you want to just to say the Shah Na Na? I want to just say there is Muhammad. no God. There is no God, but uh, <clears throat> Holololo and Ahmed X Muslim is his handicap worshiper. Just want to make sure that's the Shada. Yeah. So this is the beauty of the Kaaba. Show this to your Muslim friends and tell them. So this was built by Abraham, huh? Uh, those cinder blocks. Was so Abraham used modern construction, cheap construction cinder blocks? Are you sure? Okay. I mean, okay. So here we go. This is, remember the movie Romancing the Stone? You got to lick it before. This is the Kaaba. This is the reverence. You show the Kaaba. This is the reverence. Okay. What's he doing with his tongue? I've seen that in a movie before. That's so disgusting, man. You know, because I've I've been told by Christian Prince, and maybe your research has confirmed it, that the encasing is supposed to represent a female body part. And so yeah. because he's put that in my mind, and I'm seeing what this guy's doing, how disgusting and perverted and satanic. My goodness, man. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so understand, this is... I don't know, man. I don't know. First of all, it does look like a brick poop house. Okay, it's disgusting, cheap cinder block. And I don't know. I don't know. They are praying to it. No, they are literally touching and venerating and praying. And they say that, no, Christians are like, you know, you guys are like, like doing veneration of idols, you know. Like, what is this? You are praying to a black stone. They're literally praying. They're licking it. They're lick, not kissing it. They are licking the thing. So, so I don't know. Okay, yeah. That this is show them these pictures and ask them what are we to make of this. You know, they'll say, yeah, he's not a real Muslim. Okay, moving on. Okay, so now Casey Cresswell, citing E. Littman's opinion, identified the etymology of the name Bakum with Habakkuk. Blah blah blah. And Bakum was probably Ethiopian. There's an Ethiopian tradition that an architect from Ethiopia went to rebuild the Kaaba. Okay. And it says here, so they built it flat and they put in six columns. Originally, there were six columns. Six columns means five spaces, means five prayers a day, which we saw was part of the Yemeni tradition as well. Remember the pillars that we had when we started the very first show? You had the six pillars, the five spaces, the sacred spaces. Those are your five prayer spaces. Okay, there were six columns originally. Okay, and of course, Prophet Ibrahim Khalil al Rahman with divining arrows and a picture of Isa bin Maryam with his mother, i.e., Jesus and Mary. Okay, and of course, this is in the this is this is part of the Islamic tradition. Okay, an inscription on one of the six monolithic pillars mentions Al Makkah of Baran, right? Six pillars originally in the Quran, oh, sorry, in the Kaaba, six to Al Makkah. Okay. And of course, you've got two ibexes and a Syrian-style tree of life between two winged bulls and six warriors in procession. 
each carrying bows and a trophy, the severed hand of the defeated enemy. Okay, and now Makkah. So Makkah with the seven hands is a war and moon god. So just to remind us about that. <clears throat> so the historian Azraki, who is, that's a Buddhist name, Azraki, I think. The angels circumambulated in heaven around the celestial Kaaba, and the Kaaba on earth was similar to the one in heaven. So that building you saw, the cinder block one, that's identical to the one in heaven. So it looks like Allah is not a very good builder. Okay, Tabri related that Muhammad connected the worship of Allah and the movement of the stars. Tabri says that Muhammad said these five stars, the visible planets, rise and run like the sun and the moon and race with them together. All the other stars are suspended from heaven as lamps are from mosques and circulate together with heaven praising and sanctifying Allah with prayer. Their circulation today is what you see, and that is their prayer. <clears throat> and according to Azraki, these statues of Mary and Jesus remained in the Kaaba from the time of Muhammad until the Kaaba was destroyed by fire in 683 AD. And the house contained six pillars, and the representation of Jesus was on the pillar next to the door. Now, hold on. Muhammad is just telling us that this whole thing is astrological, just as we've seen here. Astrological. Okay, those are Muhammad's words. Right? This is an astrological symbolism. We'll look at that again more closely. <clears throat> Any comment before I go on, Sam? So I want people to pay attention to what you confirmed because I've quoted Azraqi in previous articles. You guys understood that in the Kaaba, they had images of Mary, Jesus, and Abraham. Are you paying attention? Guys, make sure by the grace of God's spirit, you're understanding the information so that you can share the information. That's the whole point. He's educating you to weaponize you to destroy Islam for the glory of Christ. So you had images of Mary, Jesus, and Abraham in the Kaaba. So though it's connected with astral worship, there's some element of Christ Christian influence that predates Muhammad. Make the connection. Yep. So I'll continue here. So make that. So let's make a note of that. Now let's just briefly, right? Uh, I'm not going to get into all of this. Okay. John the Damas, John the Damascino, Saint John of Damascus, was writing about the Mohammedans, saying that they worship a black stone that was the hand of Venus. In the Kaaba, the black stone is inserted into the female part. Okay, the vajayjay. Right? That's exactly what I just said. Didn't I say that, brother? <laughs> And Venus is the goddess of fertility, and she is placed in the wall. The Kaaba represents Venus, and the black stone is, as St. John said, the hand of Venus. Now, let's continue. Lucifer is one of the various figures in folklore associated with the planet Venus. The entity's name was subsequently absorbed into Christianity as a name for the devil. Modern scholarship generally translates the term in the relevant Bible passage where the ancient Greek figure's name was historically used, okay? That's Isaiah 14, 12 as morning star or shining one rather than as a proper noun, Lucifer. So Lucifer, morning star, shining one, these are sort of interchangeable. Don't forget, al Makkah is the shining one. al Makkah was, you know, also the, the morning star. As a name for the devil in Christian theology, the more common meaning in English, Lucifer, is the rendering of the Hebrew word, Hillel. Hillel. Now, we discussed last week, Hillel is the crescent moon. That is why Mary is stepping on the crescent moon. Hillel is Lucifer. Hillel is the shining one, the moon. That's the symbol of Satan. The prophet has named the black stone, the right hand of God, the Yamin Allah, and for the purpose... <clears throat> One poses there one's hand to conclude the pact, and God obtains their pact of allegiance and submission. So you pose your hand there, and Allah obtains their pact of allegiance. So you swear your allegiance. In the Quranic terminology, Allah is the king, and in his realm there's a metropolis, and in the metropolis, blah, 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 Beit Allah, the home of Allah. Okay? So if a subject wants to testify to his loyalty to Allah, he has to go to the royal palace and conclude personally the pact of allegiance. Now, don't forget... This pact of allegiance is effectively, it falls into commerce, okay? The Shahada and the, there's a name for it. It's called Bayah or Bayan. I can't remember which exactly. It's Bayah or Bayan. This falls under commerce. You are selling something. You are selling your allegiance. You are selling your eternal soul to the deity. Sam, within the Christian view, when you sell your soul to a deity, which deity is that typically that people sell their souls to? To the, the, to the devil, I got tongue tied. To Satan, Lucifer, devil. Yep, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So understand. So Hillel, 
okay, is the Arabian moon god. So Lucifer is one of the various figures in folklore associated with the planet, planet Venus, originally stemming from a son of the personified Dawn, the goddess Aurora in Roman mythology. This name was absorbed into Christianity, okay? And it's Hillel, right? Understand, it is Hillel. And a similar name used by the Roman poet, Catullus for the planet in its evening aspect, that is Venus, is Noctifer, or the night bringer. So Lucifer is light bringer, okay? And in Greco-Roman, so blah, blah, blah. Aurora the dawn, okay? So just wanted to put that out there, that the, the idea of Hillel is the same as what we find before. Hillel, even in the Hebrew, is Satan. And Hillel is, happens to be the god of the moon, the crescent moon. And Hillel is when, when it's Ramadan <clears throat> and you see the crescent moon, that's when Muslims rejoice because, hey, Ramadan's over. We can now get all happy, right? <clears throat> okay, let me continue here. So this is about megaliths. I know you can't see this. Some of this text is rather small, so I apologize. I'll read this to you. But in its origins, it now appears the Kaaba might even have had features in common with the great stone circle on Salisbury Plain, known as Stonehenge. A proliferation of gods was worshipped at, at Mecca in the 7th century. They were associated with sacred stones and trees and, and others astral and linked with the sun, the moon, Venus, or such prominent stars as Canopus. Okay, that's the Kaaba. In the early part of the 7th century, the walls were built up, probably in alternate layers of stone and wood, like the churches of Ethiopia. This is a very old paper. <clears throat> it's a 1982 paper in a magazine called The Sciences, scientific magazine. It's referencing much older archaeology, all right, from David A. King, right? And he's writing a book about the Kaaba, a study of the sacred directions in medieval Islam, all right? So, <clears throat> and he says here, the major axis of the Kaaba is aligned to the rising of Canopus at about the first century AD. The Canopus is the brightest fixed star in the southern hemisphere. I think it is precisely aligned towards the southernmost setting position of the moon at the winter solstice over the hills to the southwest of Mecca. So we're finding now the Kaaba has astrological alignments like many megaliths in Europe and Eastern and South America and so on. <clears throat> Every 19 years, the crescent moon sets at the spot on the horizon visible along the southeast side of the Kaaba. The lunar alignment is also found in many megalithic sites in Europe. So the Kaaba has exactly the same alignments as megalithic sites in Europe, which were worshipping astral deities. Your thoughts, sir? So, guys, if you're making the connection, you're seeing the way the Kaaba is structured and designed. It is designed specifically for the worship of the moon. If you guys are listening, that's why I'm encouraging you. Listen to what he's telling you. The fact that the Kaaba, the way it's structured, is... <clears throat> identical to other megaliths that are erected for the veneration of astral objects like the moon, destroys the lie of Muslims that the Kaaba is a shrine <laughs> built by Abraham and Ishmael for the worship of the true God. The overwhelming massive evidence shows its design and structure identical to other pagan shrines erected for the worship of the stars, particularly the moon, the evidence is overwhelming. It's over for Islam, if you understand what he's showing you. Why is he making these connections? Why are they saying that the Kaaba, the way it's set, it's like other megaliths and other places in Europe, all of which have this in common for the worship of astral objects, specifically the moon. You can't get away from well, this. Yeah, now the pagan Arabs worshipped, had a lunar solar calendar. In other words, a, a calendar that was a mixture of sun and moon. So a guy called Muhammad comes along and he says, hey, we're not having any of that. We're going to a strictly moon calendar. Nothing to do with the moon, though. Nothing to do with the moon. Right. <clears throat> so, now, this paper is called Faces of the Kaaba. Okay? And it states here, the sciences, 22-5, May, June, 1982. It is a primitive observatory, a weather vane, and appointed to allow. It is a primitive observatory and a weather vane. It seems likely that the Kaaba was a microcosm of the celestial and terrestrial universe of the pagan Arabs. Each of the most important aspects of their physical world is represented of the celestial, the sun, the moon, and Canopus, the brightest star in the southern sky, are represented within the Kaaba. Of the terrestrial, the winds, the rains, and the geographic directions. Unifying the cosmos of celestial bodies, winds, rains, and directions in this way would not have been strange to pre-Islamic Arabs. Astronomical and meteorological phenomena were intimately connected in their folklore. 
their folklore was effectively their religion. You can jump in anytime, Sam, if you want to. <clears throat> now, let's have a look here in Riyadh Salihin, okay? This is an Islamic text, okay? So, but, now, these two forms of company do not indicate that Allah is with the people in their dwellings, okay? Allah, the mighty and sublime, is with them while still above the heavens on his throne. And there's no blah. Now, he says here, a thing could be above while still with you. The Arabs would say, we continue to travel as long as the moon was with us. So the moon is above you, but the moon is with you. So they would also say, we continued traveling as long as Canopus was with us. So understand, these references go into the Arab history and they're part of the Islamic literature. This is acknowledged as part of the Islamic Arabic literature. Yes? I want to comment what he just said here because in the Salafi tradition, Allah is above the throne and is with you by his knowledge, but they don't have a concept of Allah being omnipresent like some of the more mystical Sufis do where Allah can indwell you. Are you making the connection? Just like the moon is up there, it's still up there. It's not down here with us, but it still guides us wherever you go. Or Canopus is up there in the sky, not here with me, but it guides me. That's how they envision Allah. He's up there. But just like the moon is up there and Can Canopus is up there and still guiding us here, Allah's up there, but he's guiding us here. Are you making the connection? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, someone mentioned here David King, the authority who only ever visited one or two mosques and who opposes Dan Gibson, who you also cite. I've cited Dan Gibson, so yeah, and I've cited David King. So, I mean, look, I'm not talking about mosques here. We're talking about these archaeological aspects of the Kaaba, right? I mean, is that wrong? So, I mean, and, no, no. Mean, and let me yeah. comment on that. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. <clears throat> the only area that David King was wrong is in questioning the direction of the Qibla, but that doesn't mean everything he said is wrong or that everything mm -hmm. that David King affirms Dan Gibson rejects. That's not how scholarship works. There can be things that a scholar says he's right, but things that he's wrong. The only one who's closest to being perfect and infallible besides myself is my friend here. So we're the two closest thing, but go ahead. Yeah. None I mean, us look, what I'm, look, what I'm showing is there's a great deal of evidence. Now, if you want to put together a presentation, you know, with go do the research, study the facts, present them, make an argument, right? Bring something. But I mean... Are we just going to say, well, uh, I don't like that guy, therefore the whole presentation is false. All of this evidence needs to go, right? There's too much evidence here. There's far too much evidence. Even without this, there's far too much evidence. Let's continue. So, meteorological and astronomical. The Kaaba, the door is on the northeast side of the edifice facing the summer sunrise. So the door faces the summer sunrise. That is of meteorological and astronomical significance. The most sacred corner of the Kaaba is the southeast corner. The black stone is embedded there. Okay. And it is defined by the rising of Canopus and the summer sunrise. <clears throat> so now you've got the black stone faces the rising of the star Canopus and the summer sunrise. And of course, Canopus is the brightest star in the southern sky. It is significant in the alignment of the Kaaba. The major axis of the Kaaba is aligned to within two degrees of the light rising of Canopus at the first century. The minor axis is aligned towards the southernmost setting position of the moon at the winter solstice over the hills to the southwest of Mecca. And this lunar alignment is found in many megalithic sites in Europe, as I've mentioned. Okay, now he says here, now he does say, I suspect that the original Qibla or direction of prayer of the pagan Arabs was towards the rising sun. Muhammad prohibited his followers from praying at sunrise. His intent was to set his sect apart. Right? Now, on one's right, Yamin, the south wind blows. Okay, so he says if pagan Arabs, blah, blah, blah. So, on one's left hand, the Shamal hand, the north wind blows from Al-Sham, Syria, the root of which has to do with misfortune. On one's right hand, the Yamin, the south wind blows from Yaman. Oh my, back to Yemen, the root of which relates to good fortune so the direction of prayer places yemen on your right which means that you get good fortune from yemen because yemen is not important to islam so any thoughts on before i go on <clears throat> you got this troll rosemary who's like a typical jezebel narcissist that uh, mm. she thinks that we're thin-skinned just because we offered a criticism 
she's guilty of the very thing she condemns us for because we simply said David King is not wrong all the time. She gets offended because she has a Jezebel spirit like a narcissist. So she's going to get the hell out of here. So we're going to muzzle her and cause her to go back to her vomit. Continue, brother. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so she's complaining about the Kibla. I mean, I've got thousands of facts here, but hundreds of pages and fine. Okay. So moving on. <clears throat> this lunar alignment of the Kaaba may well have been intentional. The Quran states that Allah made the Kaaba a structure for men and for the sacred month, which could be a reference to the regulation of the lunar calendar. So intercalation, that's where you mix between the sun and the moon and you add a few days to the moon calendar to balance out because the moon cycle is not exactly even. Since this was banned by the Prophet in favor of a strictly lunar calendar, it is not difficult to see how this feature of the Kaaba might have been forgotten in later Arabic writings. In other words, the lunar alignments and the meteorological alignments could have been forgotten or deliberately suppressed. Right? That's just what he's saying in this in this talk in this section here. So I'll, so that section's done. But uh, Sam, do you get anything from that before I go on? <clears throat> no. Again, I just want to reiterate to people: you're not here to be entertained. You're here to learn the facts. Why? He's providing the service because he believes the Lord Jesus has called him to equip the saints, destroy the threat of Islam. Muslims get saved. The church is, is protected. So we need to prepare ourselves for spiritual, physical battle. You need to study the material. You need to understand the facts. You need to share them. Don't just come here to be entertained. Do your part. He's putting his life on the line. Muslims are seeing his face. That means they know who he is. And he can be attacked anytime and killed. But he's counting the costs and he believes Jesus is worthy. Yeah. He's taking the time, study the material, use them. Go ahead. I mean, she could say, look, I don't like the Kaaba thing by David King. I don't like the, the Qibla direction. Okay, fine. But the Kaaba points towards Canopus. The Kaaba's aligned to Venus. The Kaaba's aligned to the sun. The Kaaba's aligned to this. Brother, you oh, don't is need that to. wrong now? Brother, you yeah. said nothing wrong. If you actually go back and listen, you were very gracious. You were not rude. I was gracious. In fact, I was actually saying, we do agree that David King is wrong. And his criticism of Dan Gibson, but it doesn't mean he's mm -hmm. wrong. She's the one who got sensitive because she's still upset that they took her baby. Rosemary doesn't know where her baby is, so she's upset. So go ahead. Okay. All right. So Atar, the gender fluid God, a lot. Okay. So understand people go, well, you know, uh, the God Atar, you know, was, was, was born at, at five minutes after three on Tuesday, the 14th of April in the year six. One one and Lloyd, you said he was born at fourteen minutes after three. No, it was twelve minutes after three. You are a liar and a deceiver, and we no longer trust you because you got the time of his birth wrong by two minutes. Now, hold on, these people were idiots. These people were mixing and matching and swapping and doing what the heck they pleased. They took a little bit from this and a little bit from that, and they mashed it together, and they were making up what's called fiction, okay? So the guy next to you would be trying to outdo you with his fiction so that his lies were better than your lies. So when, this, when they say that these things fit into very neat logical categories, that unfortunately isn't the case. So Atar, the gender fluid god. Atar, also known as Ishtar and a bunch of other names, Semitic deity's role, name, and gender varied by culture. His role, name, and gender. So in other words, it could be male today, female tomorrow, male here, female there, different name, different role, same deity. Right? Understand, right? Either male or female, always identified with the planet Venus. Right? So the one common theme here is the planet Venus. In pre Islamic South Arabia, it was worshipped as a god of war. Alat, according to recent study, is believed to have been introduced into Arabia from Syria and was the moon goddess of North Arabia. If correct, she corresponds to the moon deity of South Arabia, Al Makkah. Alat was Al Makkah. So now you had a woman goddess who's the male goddess of South Arabia. Okay? So understand these designations, these names. I say, well, look, you know, Alat is not al Makkah. They're different gods. And, and look, you know, no, no. These people were mixing and matching. And these are not logical people. Okay? They're not trying to do science. They're trying to make up stories. Okay? So he was also known as Vad, Am or Shin, as he was called. The difference being the gender. So sometimes they say, well, this is a female God and this is a male God. Lord. You're wrong. It's like, no, it's the same God. They just, and this is in the archaeology of world religions by Jack Finnegan. Okay. And Arabia shared the gods of Mesopotamia being so close to Babylon, except the genders and symbols of these deities were later swapped around. For instance, the sun God Shamash became the sun goddess Shams. And in Southern Arabia, Ishtar became the main male storm God Atar. 
It's all the same deity, just renamed. Just want to point that out. It's Yes, it is a possible inspiration for the transgender movement. Exactly. The, because spirit is what matters. You know, matter is not important, right? Your idea is the spirit, but that's all that's important here. Reality doesn't matter. And that's okay, also so, like the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says he's going to make Mary Magdalene a male to make her worthy, right? So do you see yep. all these elements? Yeah, and well, and that's actually true because also someone wrote to me and says, Lloyd, you, you're taking the Gospel of Thomas too literally. It's like, no, I'm not. It's like you're just trying to whitewash something. Okay, this is the archaeology of world religions. That's the book here. The background of primitivism, Zoroastrian, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Shinto, Islam, and Sikhism by Jack, by Jack Finnegan. Okay, the temple was built by a Muqarib. Okay, Muqariba. Okay, so a priest king named Blah Blah, and he was dedicated to al makkah al makkah or al Mukka was the moon god corresponding to Sin in Mesopotamia, chief deity of the Sabaeans. He was conceived of as masculine throughout South Arabia. He was known to the Manaeans by the name of Wad, to the Katabanians as Am, and to the Hadramauts as Sin. His consort was the sun, Shams, the same as Shamash in Mesopotamia. See, female, male, they just swapped out. Their son completed the triad, was Athar, he was the planet Venus and corresponded to the Babylonian Ishtar. So now we've just learned that Alat is Venus, is Ishtar is same thing, same deity. They were just, it's the same, even though you got like 50 different names, it's the same three people recycled. Making sense, Sam? Perfect sense. Okay, so let's continue. <clears throat> so this is in a paper called The Stylistic and Comparative Study of Published Pre-Islamic Stone Sculptures from Arabia by Hamid Ibrahim al Mazru. That sounds Catholic. That sounds very Catholic. That's that's like that's that's like Saint Augustine Hamid Ibrahim al Mazru. That's, that's a, yeah. So contrast it. That's definitely a Catholic name. We contrast that. The thesis is submitted for the doc degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, 1990. Let's see what this guy says. The religion of ancient South Arabia was an astronomical religion based on the worship of gods personified by heavenly bodies, similar to that of the northern Semitic Arab people. These gods can be incorporated into one triad composed of the planet Venus, the moon god, and the sun goddess. And he quotes here a couple of scholars, right? At the head of the pantheon stood Attar, the god identified with the planet Venus. He was given particular veneration, that's Alat, okay? To whom most of the shrines of South Arabia were dedicated. Well, Alat, don't forget, Alat was female and Alat could also be male. Alat is Venus and then Alat is the main god, Al-Makkah. Al-Makkah is Allah. Do you understand how this, this is like the morphing power. These guys just are like transformers, okay? His name appears in hundreds of inscriptions and is also compounded into the names of many individuals, such as Karabit, okay? Fascinating. Karab, we get this back to Mukarabba, okay? The moon god was known in South Arabia by different names, Amman, Anbe. Il Makkah or Haubas, Wad, Al Sain, okay, and Shin to the Hadramautis, right? The third of the tribe is the sun goddess, believed to be the consort of the moon god. The sun goddess was also known by different local names, notably Dat, Bakadan, and Dabiat Himyan to the Sabaeans, Nikra to the Manaeans, and Dliat Zaharan. And we get here back to Zuhra, okay? So back, we get back to Saturn as well, to the Katabanians. You see, because, well, Lloyd, you know, it's like, this is clearly, you know, you're wrong, because it's, here we're talking about the sun, and over there, that's Saturn. Look, you're talking to a bunch of low IQ pagans who didn't care about scientific accuracy. They were making up fancy gods that were nicer than your god, okay? This is like, this is a, a dick swinging contest. That's all it was. And they were simply taking ideas, mixing them together, smashing them up, and my story is better than your story. My lie is better than your lie. That's what we're dealing with here. It's, this is not people going, well, you know, let's be scientific about this. All right? Okay. Muhammad's sons. Okay, so Muhammad had a couple of sons, Abdalat and Abmanav. Now, we just found that Alat is Venus. Alat is the primary god of the region, right? And Abdmanaf. Manaf is the moon god. Alat is the main god. Okay, Alat, Manaf. Okay, Naf is the sun god, sorry. Star god. Star. Nearly all the sources assert that Muhammad's eldest son by Khadija was named Al Qasim, while his youngest son by Maria was named Ibrahim. Most sources state that Khadija also bore a second son, and this is where the controversy begins. Usually called Abdallah, slave of Allah. And remember, before Muhammad was born, and even when Muhammad was born, Allah was Al Makkah, was Sin, was Baal, right? 
Some sources say Khadija had three sons, al Taib the good and al Tahir the pure. Oh, <laughs> great. Ibn Sa'd says these were by names, nicknames given to one person that his real name was Abdullah. Okay. At the time when this happened, Muhammad was not yet Muslim and therefore Abdullah would have been Baal, would have been al Makkah. This is contradicted by tradition from Nawawi and Nawawi is a giant in Islamic jurisprudence. He is the guy that perfected the Sharia in the Shafi school. He is one of the major scholars of Islam, who says that Muhammad's two sons by Khadija were named Abdul Uzza and Abd Manaf. Abdul Uzza, okay, never mind Abdullah. Abdul Uzza, okay, she's also one of the three, you know, the three cranes, blah, blah, blah. Ibn al Mutana also says the second son was named Abd Manaf. Abu Ubaida says it was the first son who was named Abd Manaf. Ibn Nasir al Din says that Al Qasim was the third son born after Islam. Ibn Kathir says, that Ibn Haytham spoke to Hisham Ibn Urwa, Aisha's nephew, and Ibn Haytham asked if it was true that they were named Al Taib and Al Tahir, and Hisham replied that he's a lie. The names are Abdul Uzza and Abd Manaf and Al Qasim. I don't want to call Aisha's nephew a liar. These traditions are contradictory, and it is not possible to harmonize all the information. It is possible that Abdul Uzza was the real name of Khadija's son by her first husband, and he died in infancy and is called Abdullah in the surviving records. That would leave Al Qasim and Abd Manaf again, another another astral deity, another pagan god, as one of the names of Muhammad's sons. And Al-Qasim, distributor apparently, was an acceptable name for a Muslim. But if Muhammad did have a son called Abd Manaf, later Muslims would have been embarrassed over this blasphemous name. They might have given the child the by names Al-Taib and Al-Tahir to cover up the real name before decisively renaming him with the pious Abdullah. Precisely. In fact, let me give a parallel to the Old Testament that's reverse. Mm -hmm. Understand what he just said. The Muslim sources are full of contradictions. They can't agree how many sons Khadija had and how many sons with Muhammad. If it's one son with different names, two sons, so on and so forth. Understand what he just said in the last part. When they were given the names Tahir and Tayyip, this may have been a cover-up in order to purify any pagan elements and connections with Muhammad and Khadija because the Muslim sources teach that Muhammad and Khadija admittedly worshipped the gods and goddesses and sacrificed to the daughters of Allah. And then Muhammad later repented. Now, let me give you an example in the Bible. I'll make it real quick. You'll find if you read 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, and then you compare it with Chronicles, you have one of the sons of Saul named Ish Baal, meaning man of Baal. Later, his name is changed to Ish Bosheth, man of shame, changing the word Baal to shame. So you're finding a pattern in the Bible where you have Israelites who are associated with, let's say, the pagan god Baal. Then a later writer changes that element of the pagan god's name. That's part of the name of the individual, Ish Baal, meaning man of Baal to Ish Bosheth, man of shame. Shameful that he was associated with Baal. So you're seeing a pattern even in the Bible. You find this. Go ahead, brother. All right. <clears throat> Muhammad's pagan family. Okay. There was Abd Manaf was the great grandfather of Muhammad and progenitor of the ruling Banu Hashim crime clan of the Quraysh. Okay. So Abd Manaf, another Abd Manaf, which was a name which would cause the Muslim shame. Hashim was the son of Abd Manaf. So he had Abd Manaf, son of Abd Manaf. Abdul Muttalib was the first Meccan to introduce this practice, dying here with henna to his fellow tribespeople. Okay, Abdul Muttalib, during a visit to Yemen. So this practice of dyeing your hair with henna in Islam comes from Yemen, from Abdul Muttalib, apparently. That's in the Encyclopedia of Islam, volume 9, page 383. Another link to the Yemen. Manaf was one of the greatest deities of Mecca, according to Al-Tabri. And Manaf, a deity of ancient Arabia, the exalted, and describing Atar, Venus, at its zenith. Venus, we just discovered, is Alat. Alat is Al-Makkah. Al-Makkah is Allah. Al-Makkah, Allah is Baal. Baal is Allah. Allah is Allah. So, understand, this becomes an unholy mess, but understand, an epithet of the sun they mention as well. So, so this is all, they're starting to merge. All of this nonsense is merging into one. They're not clean separate categories. They're now just starting to become one. Okay, let's continue. There's Abd Manaf is one of the four sons of Qusay, the reformer of the cult in Mecca. His mother had promised him to the gods so as to protect him from the evil eye, who was so handsome that he was surnamed Al Kamar, the moon. Okay, there we go, according to Al Tabri, Al Kamar, the moon. So they were even then, at the time 
of Muhammad, they were still using these pagan names. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, this guy is Sheikh Ibrahim al Qatan, head of the Islamic Sharia courts, Jordan. Okay, that's him with Professor Ismail Bal Ogun. Okay. Um, of course, Ogun is the <laughs> Nigerian god of war. Okay. Um, but um, this is a symposium on monotheism in Islam and Christianity. Okay, great stuff. So Herodotus, the Greek historian, tells us that North Ravens had a god and goddess named Oratal and Alilat. That's Herodotus. So the, these Arabians had Oratal and Alilat. Oratal is simply a corruption of Allah or Allah Ta'ala, Allah Most High. This notice is before Islam. Now you've got, we've mentioned Shin. al Makkah was called Allah Ta'ala. This is from 450. <clears throat> this is before Muhammad. Now we know Allah Ta'ala was around before. Allah had been around in pagan Arabia before Muhammad was even born. Islamic Sheikh Ibrahim al Qatan, in a lecture given to the international blah blah blah, said the religion of Arabia can be traced by the epigraphic and inscription evidence back to 500 BC. That's this dude here. Okay. So the Arabian, so the Arabian religion can be traced for a thousand years before Muhammad. They had gods named Baal Shaman, Du Samawi, Rahman, which they got from Syria, Persia, and the pagan Kabbalist Jews and Allah. According to Sheikh Ibrahim, Allah was the highest deity. His name was inscribed on stone by Jewish traders along the Arabian trade routes. The paganized Jews also called him Rahman, or the Arabs called him Allah. It is clear that these sacred concepts, such as Allah the Kaaba with its black stone, and running around the Kaaba seven times, climbing Mount Arafat, and the god named Rahman and stoning Satan, which they got by quote-unquote revelation, was salvaged from the dung heaps of ancient paganism in Arabia. So we have learned that Allah is not Elohim of the Bible. We now see that he did come from the era before Islam, but what is the primal origin of Allah's name and how far back can we trace Allah's steps? But I just thought I'd throw that in there. So that's from an Islamic scholar, this guy, the head of the Islamic Sharia courts in Jordan. Okay, thought I'd throw that out there. So <clears throat> any comments before I go on, Sam? I'm going to try and finish this today. 12 more yeah, slides so to go. Yeah. The point emphasize he's giving you a plethora of sources Many are Muslim scholars, ancient and modern. Many are Islamists, scholars of Islam, who are not Islamophobes, who hate Islam, want to bash Islam. And he's giving you simply the archaeological and inscriptional data that predates Islam. So these are all reliable sources from a whole range of scholarship. So the Muslims can't simply brush this aside as Islamophobia. Because that's all they can do because they can't refute the facts. So keep that in mind by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue, brother. Yeah, so let's continue. <clears throat> so, okay, now some archaeology. And we'll finish. We'll try and finish off. I have like 13 or 12 more slides to go. The Moon Temple of Shin in Arabia. And this is a paper called Reports of the Research Committee, Society of the Antiquaries of London. Number 13, the Tombs and Moon Temple of Hureida or Hadramaut, Yemen, basically. Okay, by G. Captain Thompson. We started off this in the very first episode. G. Captain Thompson's son or grandson or granddaughter or whatever went and restarted the 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 archaeology that he that he never finished. Okay, so we actually started, so we've come kind of full circle now. Synopsis: The Moon Temple, the first to be excavated in Arabia, is visible from afar on a slight eminence in the then cultivated valley. Its main facade overlooks an artificial depression, possibly connected within the temple service. On the other three sides, there's a complex of still buried buildings, which may form part of the Haram. Okay, so this is a pagan temple that has a Haram. The site was completely enveloped in sand, and the local tradition knew nothing of it. There were stumps of stone pillars. There were two flights of stairs that gave access to the platform. The orientation of the building follows the Mesopotamian practice of setting the corners to the four cardinal points, just like the Kaaba, by the way. The main facade looks southwest, just like the Kaaba, just so by sheer accident, I guess. It had been twice extended without destruction. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, there are formal inscriptions and nine graffiti used and reused, all except one or perhaps two are Sabaean. They're in the Hadramaut dialect, Yemen. Okay. So they provide no absolute dating, but cover the period of time in which the temple buildings grew to their final form. There are 22 inscriptions where you find dedication to sin. The deities Dat Himyan, Hao, Al Makkah are also named. Don't assume these are different deities because they have different names. Different tribes have the different name for the same deity. So they would simply worship a different aspect of the deity. So they may well be the very same deity under different names. Okay. 
the most popular name is obviously Shin, the Babylonian name. They're not even using al Makkah. They're using the direct Babylonian name. Here, they are disintegrated mud brick, okay? And the mud brick clinched the evidence, which was further supported by scarce or scarce shards and masonry fragments, some finely dressed, one of which bore, bore the letters S-I-N, or Shin. So now they're using the Babylonian name in Yemen, okay? And it says here, an incomplete Shin invocation is archaic, okay? And it invokes the moon god under the Sabaean name al Makkah. right? This is... So understand now we're talking a direct link to Babylon within the archaeology, within the inscriptions. Can I make one this, comment real quickly before we go? Brethren, this is why if you read Revelation 18 and 19, it says Babylon, which is a code name for the superpower that will arise in the latter days, is the mother of all har harlotry, all idolatry, all blasphemy. Because you see all this satanic <clears throat> influence and teaching finds its roots in Babylon. So any other nation that resembles the satanic pagan worship that originates from Babylon is called Babylon. That's in Revelation 18. And one thing I want you to keep in mind, and I, this is a point I need to hammer. Are you going to tell me that the overwhelming archaeological evidence and inscriptions prove that in Arabia, sin was worshipped, the moon god sin, and it called al maqa So the evidence is overwhelming, but they were not worshipping the moon god at the Kaaba, so that Allah of the Kaaba is the moon god. Are you that delusional? It is overwhelmingly clear. Allah of the pagans in the Kaaba, at the Kaaba, was the moon god. Case closed. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. I mean, I think I've presented overwhelming evidence to that effect, that it's it's Allah, right? I don't think there's any way to, to get out of that. <clears throat> and the archaeology is, is explicit. So they speak here of assessment of the architectural, architectural influences of the moon temple is not easy, but it's a moon temple, they say it. Assimilation of foreign models, oh, assimilation of foreign influences is manifest. Its orientation, as well as its main deity, are rooted collaterally far back into Babylon. Okay, so in other words, they were syncretic. They were borrowing ideas and mixing them and taking them and, you know, sticking them in, right? From whence the Persian Empire derived through Assyria some of its earlier stimuli. So the, so the Zoroastrian influence as well, but that's another story, another day. Okay, and they mentioned here that the earliest building might derive equally from Persia, Phoenicia, or Asiatic Greece, because they were sharing ideas. There was a mixing, a blending of ideas. Okay. And um, and the extent to which buildings in South Arabia were indebted to the Near Eastern Asiatic world of the last five and a half centuries before Christ is well exemplified at Marib, where Glazer reported evidence for linen clamps upon the masonry. So in other words, we're looking at 600 BC, 500 BC already. These guys were mixing ideas. They were traveling the world. They were getting ideas through the trade routes that we spoke of in the beginning. <clears throat> And why, yes, Robert Jansen says, why the Muslims kept the moon as a symbol? Yes, correct. Why did they retain the original symbol to Al-Makkah? Right, the Babylonian symbol. Right, going on. So, C.S. Kuhn, trade links and war gods. Now, we started off by talking about trade links. Like the trade links were the internet of the day. Their surface message is clear. The kingdoms of southern Arabia, like that of the Nabataeans, were in contact with the entire ancient world, from Rome to India, and perhaps beyond, and they mean even China. Objects of Roman, Greek, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Indian manufacture abound. Scarabs, scarabs, amulets, bronze statues in Roman manner, dragon feet, and great bunch ornamentation in the Syrian and Byzantine manner, and Greek columns all witness the linkage of this region with the Mediterranean. The names of the gods are monotonously repeated, okay? And this is indicative of a devotion to religion, and this phalli to oxen, okay? So basically, phalla, phallus, yeah, you know what that is. And oxen, okay, oxen, ox horns, okay, and they were these people were very much involved with religion, animal figures, okay, fine and well. And it says here, and it says Arabia came into prominent prominence as a highly civilized agricultural region, flourishing near the source of the incense trade route, which went up from the Hadramaut from Yemen, okay, to Mecca, Medina, and the ports of the Eastern Mediterranean. It also served as the principal or only route by which goods from India were transposed. Transposed. Transshipped 
and carried over land. Can I comment right there? Sorry? Before you, but I want to comment on this. Brethren, here's your connection with Indian paganism, because some people have been commenting, because I want to emphasize this. And the citations he's giving from C.S. Kuhn, a bona fide credentialed archaeologist. Pay attention. The Nabataean kingdom, which is in <clears throat> Petra over there. It's Syria in Jordan. Nabataean kingdom. Nabataeans. Did you catch it? They had contact with India and that they found Indian manufacture, you know, meaning stuff that was made in India. They found it showing there's a connection with the Southern Arabian kingdoms and Indian culture, which now makes a link between Indian paganism, idolatry with the idolatry paganism of the Arabs. There's your connection. So I just want I to was actually going to say exactly the same thing because look, I did not have time to go into that. That's actually a separate, very detailed topic on its own. But you can certainly trace, you can certainly link Hinduism, Hindu paganism into Islam. I mean, I'm I've looked at the evidence and I'm convinced that there's a clear link. I just haven't gone into it. That's like a separate topic. I didn't want to like mix the two here. This is okay, but yes, I'd agree. India, but India was a place they were visiting, that's for sure. C.S. Kuhn says, okay, there are two Sabaean periods. The earlier is called the Mukarib period, in which the king bore the title Mukariba. Okay. Remember Mukaribal, the Mukarib of Baal, right? Which indicated a primary priestly office and later in which he was called Malik, the common Semitic word for king. So remember, the Mukarib is the Yemeni king who worships Baal, who does the will of Baal in the world, right? He follows Baal. Then they changed it to Malik. Right, because Malik, well, it wasn't Baal. They were trying to separate themselves from the pagan origin. So they became the Malik. But the problem is Malik is connected to Moloch, which is still Baal. Then, of course, they had to drop the word Malik and they had to take the word. Um, then they became the Amir. Right. But the Amir had a problem because it was linked to um, heresy. And, of course, they had to drop Amir and then became the Caliph. Understand? They kept dropping the word once, once the, once the, the origin gave the game away. They changed the title. So a parallel transition took place in Kataban, but that, that's the important thing. So Mukarib becomes Malik, Abd al Malik, the slave of the Malik. Who is the Malik? Right? Ask yourself, Malik, Moloch. We've covered that before. And he says the most important Mukarib of Saba was the Kariba Illu, Illumku, okay, the priest of the god Il. We've mentioned Il before. Who is that? Baal. Right, we've covered, and he killed 4,000 men in a war against Kataban. Why? Because it's a war god. Jihad is part of your devotion to your god, right? To the war god. Then he turned on Ma'an and killed 45,000. He took 63,000 prisoners and 31,000 head of cattle. So, understand you're looking at the war and moon god. These are dated 715 and 685 BC. This crap's been going on for a long time. Okay, then he says. Okay, so this is before the arrival of Islam, and it is relatively well known in 24 BC. Now, what's interesting is, okay, so Mecca. So, in 24 BC, 24 before Christ, a man called Elias Gallus, right, a Roman, he leads an expedition to conquer the whole section. Okay, so the whole section of Arabia on the right side. Okay, they decide they're going to conquer Arabia. Okay. And this was known to the Arabians, uh, to the Romans as Arabia Felix, or Happy Arabia, where the incense came from and all of that stuff. But the Romans never got there. Somewhere in the sands near Najran, the majority of them perished. And those who survived at this point, they turned back. And this is about, so what happens is they take something like 11,000 men and they decide to sail from Alexandria, I believe, in Egypt, down and they, 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 ships, they have a shipwreck. There's a storm or something. They shipwreck somewhere in the region of Makkah and they walk down to Yemen. And they find no evidence. There's, and don't forget, they have a historian with them. I believe they had a historian, a, a very famous first century BC historian was with them. <clears throat> and he writes about this. That's why I have records of it. And he makes no mention of Mecca or whatever. Nothing. Not a single word. They walked down that whole section of coast. They walked past Mecca, supposedly. Never saw it. I mean, I asked myself, when, 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 when Hagar... When she walked all the way, the 1,200 kilometers with her bottle of Sprite, right, all the way from Jerusalem or Hebron to Mecca, she gets there and she's looking for water. I'm asking myself, why didn't she just go knock on someone's door? It's the oldest city in the world. Well, what do you think, Sam? Because it's a conspiracy. The Illuminati has concocted all this overwhelming, massive 
archaeological, textual, textual, and scriptural data to attack Islam because you're Islamophobes, because this has nothing to do with Islam. Allah and his messenger know best. Repent. You're right. You're right. I Okay, so... Okay, now, so about 270 AD, the Aksumite Ethiopians conquered Arabia Felix and ruled it, and they were Christians, and they set up bishops and bishoprics, so they brought Christianity with them. If you brought a bishop, you set up a cathedral. If you had a cathedral, you had a Bible. Do you understand? That's why the story that there was no Christianity in Arabia before, oh, about 938 AD, you see, so therefore the Arabians, you know, it's a unique religion that has nothing to do with Christianity. <coughs> So no, because these guys brought a full Bible. These guys had a full Bible at that time already. Okay, these these Ethiopians had. They were Christians. They were full on Christians, right? And they were and they speak of immigrants from the Hadramaut who had carried Semitic civilization to Ethiopia. Okay, so they were descendants in whole or in part of immigrants from the Hadramaut who had carried Semitic civilization to Ethiopia, and they became Christianized. Okay, so you had Christians in the third century in Arabia with a Bible. Okay. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so the moon god's attributes, okay, so our 100 moon god attributes, Allah, okay, they speak of thus the prototype of the modern Zawiya and it's Shrech and Fakih, okay, so Sheikh and Fakih and Kabir, okay, these words existed in pre Islamic Saba. These words are not taken from Arabic, you know, from Muhammad's religion. These words derive from the Yemeni religion, from Sheba, from the Sabaeans. The Fakih, the Sheikh, these are not. Arabic Muslim terms. These are pre-Islamic terms. Okay. The inscriptions consist of the names of gods of which over a hundred are known. Many of them are attribute names such as Wad. Now the god Wad, it's an attribute. It means love. It's an attribute. See, so many of these godly names, they're not different gods. They are attributes of the god. So you had a god called love, Sadiq, truth, Rahman, the compassionate. You see, these are the attributes. So tell me something, Sam. Does Allah have a lot of attributes? Last time I checked, it said at least 99 not-so-beautiful names of Allah. So, in other words, these are not names of different gods. These are attributes. So the different tribe would worship an attribute of the god. Exactly. Not a name of a god. It's the same god under a different attribute. Yep. And these attributes, according to this paper, these passed over into Islamic terminology. They're not separate gods. See, there were one God. Under Personification. Yes. In other words, yes. this is what we take. You take an attribute and you personify it as a deity. Just like related to your point, I have an article. I did sessions, brethren. Blackstone, what he showed you earlier, is Allah's right hand. And on the day of judgment, Muhammad said, Blackstone will come to life. It will be given two eyes and a tongue to then intercede for those that used to lick it and smother it and smooch it. Yeah. So now you've got Rahman. Okay. And then I speak the God of the names is Wad of the Katabans, Am of the Habramis, Shin, and the Sabaeans, Al Makkah. All of them were the moon. They're all the same God. You see, these are just different names, different attributes of the same deity, the same being. It's all different names for the same thing. Okay. And notice here the simple truth of the matter. So Quran 38.5. Maketh he the gods one Allah, lo, that is an astounding thing. And their leaders went about, leave him, cling steadfastly to your gods. Indeed, he has a hidden objective in this. We have never heard of this, even in Christianity, the latest religion. This is clearly a newly fabricated matter. This is in the Quran. That Muhammad has taken all of the gods and just smooshed them together in a soup. And you got one god called Allah because it's a familiar name. Ask yourself, why are the Gnostic Gospels, right? You have the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Abraham or Gospel of Jesus. Think about it. If they had to make it the Gospel of Frankie, the guy in the corner, okay? If they had to make it the Gospel of the Gospel of Cecil from down the street, people go, what the? What? Who? Gospel of who? So they had to name it after something that was well known. They had to pick John and Peter and Philip and James. These were well-known names. So people had to try to give it legitimacy by attaching it to the name of a well-known apostle, a well-known disciple, a well-known follower of Jesus to try to give it credibility. The same way Muhammad had to call it Allah because Allah was a very well-known deity. But Allah was neutral. If he called it, 
if he called it Alat, everyone would go, yeah, we know that. That's the female crane god, right? She's the sun or the moon or Venus. If he had to call it Almaka, they'd go, hold on, but that's the pagan god that goes back 2,000 years. Understand. Allah is just the God. It's neutral. So, yep, okay, let's slam them all together because that, that works. Okay? And it's familiar, but it's neutral. So, notice, needless to say, this multiplication of God names does not imply an extensive polytheism. That's what Kuhn tells us. All of the names, all of the gods have been reduced to only three, the sun, the moon, and the Venus star. They are represented in sculpture as a disc, a crescent, and an eight-pointed star. Remember, this is the flag of Morocco and you know, the pointed star. Each of these three had many functions and many attributes. Each one had a name. Each attribute had a name. Each function had a name. So these names were the attributes. They could have a hundred names for the same three gods. The reduction of these to three is only exceeded by the Islamic heaping of all attribute names onto a single divinity. Although there were but three gods, each might be worshipped separately in different aspects and under different names. The sort of pagans, even though you had a hundred different gods, it was only three. But Muhammad took them all and reduced them to one who had all of those attribute names put on it. Your thoughts, Sam, before I go on. What's ironic, guys, I didn't know the course of his <clears throat> session. And I had no idea he was going to bring up chapter 38, verse 5. Go back about an hour, hour earlier. I saw mm -hmm. how this was converging. And I quoted chapter 38, verse 5. And he already had it ready to cite. You see how it works? I'm seeing the pattern. And I'm seeing that's why the pagans accuse Muhammad of taking all the gods and then <clears throat> bringing them into one. All the gods become one. He mashes them into one. And that's exactly what he's concluding with. How, how amazing. So glory to God. Yeah, actually, you know, um, someone mentioned the black flag of Islam looks like the head of Satan. Actually, I actually have done something on the black flag. I would need to go and find it on my channel. Um, if you look at, okay, hold on. Let, let me try and find something. Um, give me a moment. I'm going to try and find something quickly. Um, images, yeah. So Are these finding second. that Lloyd's? YouTube channel is linked in the description box, brethren. Go to the description box. The link is there. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Start watching his material. Pray for him and support him by the means that he has made accessible for support that the Lord will continue to provide for him and his family to do this work and pray the same for me. So go to his channel, subscribe, and watch the other stuff he's done. He's got a lot more that he's already covered than you find here. Okay, well, so I'm just going to bring this up. This is the black flag. So someone mentioned the Jolly Roger. Okay, so while that's loading, so, okay, you guys can see this up here. This is the standard, oh, there we go. This is the standard Jolly Roger. This is the flag, uh, typical flag that the pirates used, okay? Um, uh, let me bring up something else. I have this actually on my channel, but I don't have the time to search for it now. It would take me too long. Okay, now I want you to, uh, let me see here. Uh, okay, so then we've got this. Now, this is not the best one, but it's the first one I've come to. So it just makes my life easy. You see that? And I want you to compare with this. I want you to look at this. Notice this here, okay? You've got the cross swords and you've got this. Now, I, on my channel, I've got, a, I've got an article which actually shows this a lot better. But I want you to notice that when you take the black flag of, of Islam and you overlay it on this, they're basically identical. When you've got the Jolly Roger and you've got this. This is not the best example. Unfortunately, it was just the first one that I found. It is not the best one that I can find. But if you have a look at this idea. Oh, hold on. There it is. There it is. Hang on. There's an example. Uh, there was one just down here. Here we go. So if you look at this, this is not, again, the, the very best example, but come on. There we go. You cross this, you compare this, you overlay these two, you see? So there's. I have an example. I show an example and I overlay them. You'll find it the same flag. So the flag of piracy is the black flag of Islam. Now, I will mention this. Actually, 
let me bring up something that may be of, of that may be of relevance to you that might be very very useful. <clears throat> um, uh, we'll just read something to you guys. Uh, okay, so one of yeah, let me. about that I've this is sounds a little yeah. choppy. I don't know. You're losing connection. It's okay. Anglo Turkish. Okay, go ahead. Now we can hear you. Go ahead. So sorry. Okay. Anglo Turkish piracy. Okay, you should be able to see this. After peace was made with Catholic Spain in 1604, English pirates nevertheless continued to raid Christian shipping in the Mediterranean, this time under the protection of the Muslim rulers of the Barbary states, right? We know what the Barbary states were doing. They were stealing women. They took millions of people from Europe as sex slaves. They were often, these Englishmen, often converted to Islam in the process in what has been described as Anglo-Turkish piracy. Now, I can tell you the Dutch were doing this too under the protection of the Muslims. The Dutch were pirates. And so you had Anglo-Dutch, well, this this Turkish-Dutch piracy as well, right? So just thought that's a little bit of history that, that is kind of interesting that somehow they didn't tell me in school. Okay, now to continue, to move on to other more important issues. Okay, let me continue. <clears throat> okay. Um, so lunar calendar. Okay, now just notice that the moon plays a significant role in Islam because of the use of a lunar Islamic calendar to determine the date of Ramadan. The crescent moon, known as Hilal, defines the start and end of Islamic months as it did for the Babylonian calendar. Okay, so do understand. So just when you go look at the Wikipedia articles, you've got to be very careful when you read them. But notice that the lunar calendar was also used in Babylon. Just so you know, the crescent moon known as Hilal defines the start and end. And Hilal is, of course, Satan. Right, we know this, and it's also the name of the crescent moon. And Mother Mary steps on the crescent moon as a symbol of you know getting Satan under her feet. These are the phases of the moon the new moon, okay, the young moon, the waxing crescent. This is Hillel here, right? This is the old moon, the waxing gibbous. This would be Kumar, right? This is Kumar, right? Just so you know, the phases of the moon are given names, these are gods. The moon god, Il or Ila, was originally a phase of the moon god, a phase of the moon god. See, il or ila. But early in Arabian history, the name became a general term for God. So the moon was God. And it was this name that the Hebrew used prominently in their personal names, such as Emmanuel, Israel, etc., rather than the Baal of the northern Semites, which was the sun. Similarly, under Muhammad's tutelage, the relatively anonymous Ilah became al ilah the God, or Allah, the supreme being, the moon God. This is Kuhn writing, this is his thoughts on this topic, right? We now know that the influence of the late classical world on the Sabaean kingdom cannot be overemphasized. So in other words, these, these pagans were getting ideas from the classical Greek, Roman, and other and Indian worlds. Okay? Greeks of Byzantines must have been imported to the Sabaean states to make statues and carve stones. They brought in experts. In earlier periods, the Egyptian and Mesopotamian influences were equally important. The South Arabian cities were commercial metropoles of a cosmopolitan character grafted onto a simpler agricultural state in which were imported goods and styles, right? So they brought in fashions from other places like Greek and Rome. And now let's have a look here. They go on to tell us the imamate of Yemen, a modern priestly kingdom. The transition from moon, sun, and Venus worship to Islam and from Sabaean speech and writing to Arabic was not a drastic and complete change, as the Yemenites themselves may imagine, right? The Imam himself, the successor of a long line of holy ancestors, calls himself by the title Amir el Mukmanin. We've got the El here, right? Commander of the faithful, which is equivalent to Caliph. Before that, it was the Muqarib, right? So you got the Amir, then you had the Abd al-Malik, then you had the Muqarib. Right, so these are the names. The names have changed, but they're still the same. The modern Yemenite system may, without difficulty, be shown to parallel the social organization of the Sabaeans. So the modern Yemen is not that different. One would not expect it to be identical, for the modern Yemen is the composite remnant of several earlier states, adapted by a shift in religion and by northern influences. 
but it is not that different from the old Sudan Yemen of the past. You know, it's thinking and it's okay. So, okay, before I, I'm nearly done, Sam, any thoughts before I go on? Yeah, so you guys are seeing that the same <clears throat> Sabian system is still present, but it's experienced a mutation. It's the same system, slightly modified due to Islam and other influences, but you basically have a revamped ancient Sabian system that has been modified and mutated due to Islamic influence. Catch that. Catch what he's saying. So go ahead, brother. Yeah, so it's just, it's just modified, it's adapted. So it modernized and just changed over time. It just adapted, it absorbed new influences, but it retains its underlying structure. It's still the same thing under the hood. <clears throat> it camouflages itself. It's, in a sense, most parasitic, right? So, borrowed Shin. His symbol was the crescent moon. So Shin, the moon god Shin. Given the amount of artifacts concerning the worship of this moon god, it is clear that this was the dominant religion in Sumeria. Now, I added a lot of this stuff because Muslims are trying to tell me Shin is not a moon god, he's not a moon god, he's not a moon god, he's not a moon god. Al-Makkah is not a moon god, not a moon god, not a moon god. Not a... I was like, okay, fine. The cult of the moon god was the most popular religion throughout ancient Mesopotamia and Arabia, as we know. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians took the word Shin and transformed it into the word Shin as their favorite name for this deity. Austin Potts, the hymns and prayers to the moon god, Shin, PhD, thesis, 1971. Shin is a name essentially Sumerian in origin, which had been borrowed by the Semites, the Semites being the Arabs. Interesting, Austin Potts, okay. Muhammad, the Sabi. It was said about the Sabians of Haran. Now, we mentioned Haran in Turkey, just over the border from Syria, in Haran, where, where you've got three towns named after the family of Abraham, where Abraham is said to have come from. He settled there, so Abraham was in Haran. We know he was in Haran historically, right? And this was a major center of heresy as well. They used to make a yearly pilgrim to the pyramids of Egypt. Interesting, the Iranians would go to make a pilgrimage in Egypt. And I've mentioned in the beginning, you may or may not remember that I said that all of this eventually ends up back in Egypt. All of this nonsense eventually ends up in Egypt. We go back to Egypt and the mystery religions of Egypt, right? The mystery cults. And the Sabians and the Muslims do claim, the Sufis do claim that they learned the secrets of the of the hermetic secrets. They, they learned the hermetic secrets, Hermes Trismegistus. They learned this in Haran, when they got to Haran and had the big magic temple, which was run by the mother of Nabonidus, right? Who was the major proponent of Shin. And they took that with them to Spain, right? They took that knowledge, that secret knowledge, the wisdom of the ages, the hermetic knowledge they took to Spain. Maimonides says that the Sabians are remnants of the ancient Egyptian priests who practiced hieroglyphic magic. Now notice, he says here, it is a system of language and coding that can engineer consciousness. Right? Now, I've shown you guys in one of the earlier episodes that the Quran is said to be encoded in a magical fashion. Those, those, those secret, the, 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 the unknown symbols, alif, la, mim, those unknown words in the Quran, these are used to code a coded language that can engineer consciousness, create magical states. They're used for incantations. Right? And Haraf. Okay, Khuruf, Akhruf, Harf, Khuruf, Akhruf, the letter of the alphabet, the word, a Quranic reading dialect. But this is not the main meaning of Harf or Akhruf. Elam al Huruf, the science of Huruf. Onomatomancy, a magical practice based on the occult properties of the letters of the alphabet and of the divine and angelic names which they form. I've covered this before in a previous episode when I spoke of the occult aspects of Islam, right? And the connections to the KKK and the Freemasons and such. Thoth of ancient Egypt was a moon deity, though they had other deities who also served as moon deity. Thoth is Hermes Trismegistus, the father of Gnosticism. Well, technically, he's the father of Hermeticism, okay? There's an overlap with Gnosticism and Hermeticism. There's also a difference. But in the Middle Ages, there was the syncretism that occurred where they kind of, even though these ideas are often contradictory, they would merge them. And just in Islam, as the, the ideas that are contradictory, like if you look at the Quran, I mean, you get these contradictory that they have, they have a system. That they have a system in Islam for merging contradictions, right? Don't they, Sam? Right. <clears throat> so is that called abrogation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is called syncretism. This is how you merge opposite ideas that completely clash, because within this ideology, within this thinking, these are just good and evil of of both two aspects, two halves of the same coin of one whole. So basically. Um, in other words, if you if you follow this to its logical conclusion, pedophilia and non-pedophilia 
of both two sides of the same practice, two sides yin of the and same yang. Ball. Yin and yeah. yang. Yeah, so. diddling kitties and not diddling kitties is it's the same thing. It's the same. It's just two. It's just two sides that make up the whole because the one is only half, and you can't leave it hanging out there by itself. That's the stupidity that we're dealing with, and the threat that you're dealing with, the logic. So he's the father of hermeticism, right? And don't forget, he is Idris. He is the second prophet mentioned. This guy here, this Thoth of ancient Egypt, is the second prophet mentioned in the Quran. He is Idris. Okay, continuing. So she asked where they said, we are going to Allah's messenger. She said, do you mean the man who is called the Sabi with a new religion, the Sabi? They replied, yes, the same person, so come along. They brought her to the prophet and she said, a strange thing. Two men met me and took me to the man who is called the Sabi and he did such and such a thing. Now the Sabi are the Sabaeans. Now we've also discussed the Manichaeans, we've discussed the Sabaeans, we discussed these Gnostic heretical sects, we've discussed these well-known heretical Jewish messianic sects, right? In Haran, they were called the, the, Sabaean, the, the Sabians. In Yemen, they were called the Sabaeans. Now, they're not the same, right? They're both heretics there, as far as Christianity is concerned. But don't forget, the Muslims claim that these people are people of the book, but they are complete heretics. And here, Muhammad's called a Sabi. Now, the way that the Quran describes it, they're using a short name, so we don't know if it's really Sabaean or if it's Sabian. If it's the Sabians, it's a heretical sect who are Gnostics, who are Hermetics, who are magic worshippers, who are moon worshippers, who are pagans, right? But they are pseudo-Christian, right? They're, they're pseudo-Christian. So Muhammad is either one of these or he's a Yemeni pagan Sabaean. So the Quran uses the two choices. Either one is not Christian. Either one is a pagan, right? That's the crazy part. I'll just go here. So the word Sabaa, actually, so you guys must be familiar with this. Uh, let me just bring this up. Actually, okay, so okay, so sub, we've got some reps, sub, right? Do you mean the man the Sabi with the new religion? This is Muhammad, so the prophet. See, so they go to Muhammad, the man who is called the Sabi. So the simple fact is, and this is, of course, this is Sahih Bukhari, sorry, Da'if Bukhari, Volume 1, Book 7, Hadith 340. This is in the Muslim sources. Now, we know from this that the Sabis, Sam, you there? Anyway, I'll leave it to you for a moment. Go on, please. I'm nearly done. No, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, I, you don't see me? Couldn't hear you for a second there. But, yeah, any thoughts on the Sam? No, yeah, but it's uh, the hadith that you mentioned, Bukhari, he calls him a sabi. That's, that's it. So there's not much I can add because, yes, I was just giving them the link. Okay. So, yeah, let me finish up. So, okay. So now you've got this link here, right? So Thoth is an Egyptian moon deity, and they claim to be linked to this. The word sabaa means the one who has deserted his old religion and embraced a new religion. Okay. Sabaa, the Shebans, Okay. Abu Ailia said the Sabis are a sect of the people of Scripture who recite the Book of Psalms. Now again, the Sabaeans are either moon worshippers, the Yemeni moon worshippers, or they are from the city of the moon, Haran, and they follow the pagan religion that Abraham followed before he followed Yahweh. Either way, you don't have Christians. Either way, you don't have Abrahamic religion, right? Because this is what he rejected, what he turned away from. So you've got this... this known Gnostic group, okay? And the Quran provides the Sabaeans with the religious status comparable to that of the Jews and Christians, which is extremely unusual because he's a Sabi. So, but we know that these are moon worshippers. These are Babylonian pagans. You know, they're, they're two strands of completely non-Christian people. But yet the Quran thinks that these are people of the book and Muhammad was one of these people. Your thoughts, Sam? This is from the Encyclopedia of the Quran. This year, this is um, like this is good. Yeah. No, I'm just saying. By the way, uh, when you are wondering these sources, if you go to the YouTube channel, you'll see that he also has links. If you check about, there's a se there's a section on the YouTube channel that says about. Click there, you'll find links where he's got a lot of this on on a hard drive. Correct. You have it available where they can also access some of these slides and yeah. articles. It's on the YouTube channel. Now, just to 
respond to someone's question. Senor, what, Abraham was a pagan before Yahweh came up to him? Most likely, yes. Why would you be surprised? Why would you be surprised that Abraham may have been steeped in paganism and God revealed himself to Abraham and Abraham then repented and he worshipped the true God? Why are you shocked? You mean pagans can't convert and end up worshipping the one true God once revelation comes to him? I hope so because your ancestors were pagan. And now you're worshiping the true God revealed in Jesus. So possibly, yes. But go ahead, brother. Yeah. Just so you know that this last reference comes from this here, the Jane Damon McAuliffe, the Encyclopedia of the Quran. Okay. And this one has 3,956 pages. This is an extremely detailed source. Okay. This is a very, very detailed source. Right? That's where I got that reference from. Okay. So let me continue here. Okay. So then... Get Purin, okay? Sabians, Manda, and Gnosis. Now, we've just mentioned Thoth, okay? Who is Idris in the Quran. So the Egyptian god Thoth is Idris in the Quran, right? And we know, okay, so he says in the Hidden Origins of Islam, okay, he says here, early in the Christian period, Gnostic movements were quite at home in the region of Syria. That's now, now we're on the border of Syria and Turkey, right? For example, Marcionism spread into Syria at the end of the second century onwards. In addition, the Oaths of Solomon and the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas appeared in Syria in the second century as well as the Song of the Pearl, which makes me think of the Pearl of Great Price of the Mormons, but fine. Okay. And then you've got the Gospel of Thomas, you've got the Gospel of Philip and the books of Jehu, in which Seth plays an important role. So Sethian Gnosticism. Okay. And then, of course, you've got Barbalo Gnosticism, transmitted in the Apocryphon of John, the Book of John, the Secret Book of John. Okay. So they, they're trying to name these things after Christian sources. And he says, this is certainly also true of the Mandaeans from Manda, Gnosis or Knowledge. The Mandaeans exist today. The Mandaeans are the Mandaeans use the name Nasara or the Nazareans, and they are called the Sabians in the Quran. They exist today. Your thoughts, son? So here, Gerd Puen, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Gerard Puen which I believe is a pseudonym, and I was told that he actually may be Assyrian, son of Asher, one of my people. Maybe, maybe not. That's irrelevant. He said they called themselves Nasara, the Mandeans. I didn't yeah. know that. So in that source, he says, so one of their names is Nasara Nazareans. So most likely you're telling me that the reference to the Nasara in the Quran is to the Mandeans or Mandeans. And they still exist, the by the way. They have a sect that's in Iraq. They claim to follow John the Baptist, if my memory doesn't and fail. They hate me. Jesus. They claim Jesus is the exactly. evil God on earth. Yes, exactly. Understand. So this all comes around to this, the Nasara. Okay. So that is very unusual. Okay. Now, of course, I must mention that there's an issue, um, as you know, on... Um, uh, Tick History did a very good session on Gnosticism and Nazism literally the day after I did my talk on that. But he says here, two of my sources specifically state that John was a Gnostic. And if you read about the Apocryphon of John, you'll see he directly received Gnosis from Jesus, giving him the power to predict the future. He was very wrong there. Okay, I love the guest channel. I've learned a lot from him, but he calls the book of John. And then in a comment, he mentions the Apocryphon. The book of John is specifically anti-Gnostic. The book of John is thought to have been written specifically in refutation of Gnosticism, which was a problem back then already, corruption within the church. But he's not talking about the book of John. He's talking about the Apocryphon of John, the secret book exactly. of John. Just let me okay. clarify that point. Yeah. Don't confuse the Gospel of John in your New Testament, the Epistles of John, with this Gnostic forgery called the Apocryphon Gospel of John. There is a source called the Apocryphon of John. That's a Gnostic document that is falsely attributed to the Apostle John. That is a forgery. That is a lie. That's not the Gospel of John. So don't confuse the two. That's what he's trying to emphasize here. So go ahead, brother. Yeah. Okay. So back to this book that we, one of the books we quoted many times before, Tomorrow in Green, the City of the Moon God, Religions and Traditions of Haran. Remember, there's a Haran in Yemen as well, right? But this one is the one just over the border in Turkey right, next to Gobekli Tepe, right? Since the star worship played such an important role in the ancient pre-Islamic religion of the Haranians, the term Sabian came to be applied as a generic name for star worshiper or even pagan. So now she's telling us, so Muhammad's a Sabian, Muhammad's a Sabi, 
the Sabism and Deans who are Gnostics who hate Jesus. And now you've got the Sabians. She says these are star worshippers. The star worshippers, and we've just spoken about the star worship, and this is linked to, you know, the pagan astral deities. By the way, the publisher, E.J. Brill, guys, if you don't know, E.J. Brill publishes top-notch scholarly work. It only publishes serious academic scholarly works. It has to be serious scholarship, academia, and mm. they don't publish many books. That's why these books cost an arm and two legs. So the yeah, fact that she got published yeah. with E.J. Brill, that means this is a top-notch scholarly reference. Just keep that yeah. in mind. These guys are hardcore. They're expensive. As I said, the Encyclopedia of Islam will set you back $40,000. Okay? You can rent it for $3,500 a year, but then you owe them another $1,500 a year for updates. <laughs> so it's five grand a year. So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, so now, allow the moon god. Let's go to Berean Publishers now. Okay? So they ask us here. Now, look, I mean, you can have any, any issues you have with Berean Publishers or whatever. That's fine, but they ask you an interesting question. Why is Allah never defined in the Quran? Why did Muhammad assume that the pagan Arabs already knew who Allah was? That's a fair question. Muhammad was raised in the religion of the moon god Allah, but he went one step further than his fellow pagan Arabs. While they believed that Allah, the moon god, was the greatest of all gods and the supreme deity in a pantheon of deities, Muhammad decided that Allah was not only the greatest, but the only god. He said, look, you already believe that the moon god Allah is the greatest of all gods. All I want you to do is accept the idea that he is the only god. I'm not taking away the Allah you already worship. I'm only taking away his wife and his daughters and all the other gods. This is seen from the fact that the first point of the Muslim creed is not Allah is great, but Allah is the greatest. He is the greatest among the gods. Okay, We don't say that God is the greatest among the gods. We say God is great. From a Christian point of view, right? We don't say God is the greatest of who. So that's a very interesting point that these guys raise. And why would Muhammad say that Allah is the greatest, except in a polytheistic context? The Arabic word is used to contrast the greater from the lesser. That this is true seen from the fact that the pagan Arabs never accused Muhammad of preaching a different Allah than the one they already worshipped. This Allah was the moon god, according to the archaeological evidence. Remember, they said he was smooshing all the gods into one, right? Muhammad thus attempted to have it both ways. To the pagans, he said that he still believed in the moon god, Allah. To the Jews and the Christians, he said that Allah was their god too. But the Jews and the Christians knew better, and this is why they rejected his god as a false god. This Allah is a false god. Al-Kindi, the early Christian apologist against Islam, pointed out that Islam and its god, Allah, did not come from the Bible, but from the paganism of the Sabaeans. Now we're back to the Sabaeans. They did not worship the god of the Bible, but the moon god and his daughters Al-Uzza, Alat, and Manat. Dr. Newman concludes his study of the early Christian Muslim debates by stating, Islam proved itself to be a separate and antagonistic religion, which had sprung up from idolatry. Islamic scholar Caesar Farah concluded, there is no reason, therefore, to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from the Christians and the Jews. Your thoughts, Sam? This would be my last this slide. This really sounds like Bereans have published the late Dr. Robert Morey's article. So the Bereans uh, that you quoted from, I think what they did was they got permission to quote Robert Morey because these quotes are from Morey. This is why I said what you did was you vindicated the late Dr. Robert Morey who initially proposed the idea that Allah was a moon god and he got laughed at. But you came the same spirit by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to now give massive overwhelming historical archaeological proof to say he was right and his detractors were wrong and jealous. Glory to Jesus Christ. All right. So Ur is the city of the moon. Ur lives in the temple. It was the house of Shin, Allah. He was the Allah. Okay. There is no differentiation in this example between the moon god and the moon. Sumeria used a lunar calendar with 360 days, 360 idols, Muhammad has a lunar calendar. The moon god is referred to as a bull and an agricultural fertility deity. The crescent is horizontal in their latitudes. So in other words, when you go to Babylon, the crescent moon is horizontal. Because at that latitude, you get a horizontal crescent, not a vertical crescent. Oh. Okay. So now, and Aliyah to 
Allah, hold on. How many slides do I still have? My golly, did I miss? I misnumbered my slides. My, my typical of me. So typical of me. Um, oh, good grief. Okay, let me try and finish. Charles Russell Coulter and Patricia Turner considered that Allah's name may be derived from a pre-Islamic god called Aila, similar to El Ilah Jehovah. They considered some of his characteristics based on lunar deities like al Makkah, Kal, Shakr, Wad, and Warak. Waraka. Now we're back to old Waraka here. And they speak here of, okay, they speak of Yemen, and the masculine figure of Wad is represented standing, armed with arch and quiver, and a horned headgear. So now you've got this, this god Wad with arch and quiver, which is very similar to Ishmael, right, and horn and quiver, okay? And then in pre Islamic Arabia, Allah was considered a deity, okay? And it means the God. It was a title. Wellhausen says that Allah was known from Jewish and Christian sources and was known to pagan Arabs as the Supreme God. The worship of sacred stones was one of the most important practices of the Arabs. Okay. And they speak here of Semitic Nisib, to be stood upright. But other names are used, such as the Nabataean Masgida, place of prostration, and Arabic Duwar, object of circumambulation. So the pagan Arabs had their places of circumambulation, which was also a pagan practice. Okay. And Ishmael worshipped idols. Sarah did not want Isaac adopting his habits. Ishmael violated married women. He tried to kill Isaac with his bow and arrow. Okay. Now we're back to this bow and arrow symbology. Making it look like an accident. Okay. And he's as a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death and says, I am only mocking. Okay. This is within um, these Jewish sources. Yes. Okay, God cut short Abraham's life by five years so that he would not live to see his grandson violate a betrothed woman, commit murder, deny God, deny the resurrection of the dead, and despise the birthright. An angel told Hagar before Ishmael was born that he would be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's against him, and so on. He will be an archer, and God is with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. So this symbolism, so now Wad, Rahman, and Hiran, Ratlij Encyclopedia of Ancient Mediterranean Religions, even in inscriptions invoking the soul god Rahmanan, Wad, his father, is added. And in the Sabaean territory, there are several temples and priests devoted to the local worship of the god. And two temples of Wad are attested beyond South Arabia by Qariyat al Fau. So I'm just basically, uh, some new slides I forgot I added in. Yep. So make a connection. Wad is depicted as an archer, so people don't see makes the connection. Because Wad is depicted as an archer, there may be some connection to Ishmael because Ishmael is an archer. So guys yes. understand, Wad is depicted as this warrior god who's an archer. So there may be a connection with Ishmael because Ishmael is an archer and Jewish sources state. So you guys understand what he's showing you. Don't feel rushed. I want you to get the point across. That Ishmael, Jewish tradition says, committed immorality, shaming his father, and tried to kill Isaac with his bow and arrow and said, oh, I was just playing around. I was just mocking, which is why Sarah said, get rid of him. So we got that all together, right? Yeah. So once the end of this, thank you for explaining that better than I did. Okay. So notice, though, that we're talking about Wad now. Now, Wad is al Makkah. We know this. Wad is al Makkah, Makkah, and so on. Notice that Wad also happens to have a name, okay? The new moon, Sahra, is also called the new moon. Okay. There's an, a South Arabian incantation text, an incantation to do magic. Right, and he's called the new moon Sahran, right? And also, it's an epithet of the god Wad, so it's called the new moon, which is Hillel. The new moon is the new crescent, Hillel, and this is associated with again, I mean, blah blah, Wad, 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 right? And then they mentioned here in the Menaean territory, Hiran is the water course of Wad, the symbol of the god is a snake, okay? The symbol of the god is a snake. Now, you might remember that we had the coins of the god. Actually, let me go back to that because this might be interesting. And they had a symbol of the god Maka. So let me go back there and I'll find it. And you'll see here. <clears throat> I'm just going to bring this across so I don't have to go. You may or may not remember. I showed you guys this. Okay. This, if you can see this here. Let me just bring some. I'm going to zoom in as tight as I can here. This is the symbol. This is the symbol of the god al Makkah. You see this line here? al Makkah. Okay? This is the symbol of the god al Makkah. It's bent like a snake. Wow. See? It's like a hieroglyph of a snake. Mm -hmm. Okay? So just bear that in mind. Just keep that in mind. That is, that's a bent hieroglyph like a snake. And now, so Hiran is what? Hiran is also Haran. Okay? Hiran is in Yemen. 
oddly enough, and the symbol is a snake, right? So the snake, of course, Garden of Eden. So you've got that symbolism. This is a 9,000-year-old shrine in Jordan. I've mentioned this before. These are these standing stones, okay? And these are these um, these idols that have the engraven, the graven idols, right? We've mentioned these before. There's also Canopus. We mentioned Canopus, the brightest star in the Southern Hemisphere, okay? Canopus and the Kaaba is aligned to face the Canopus. It's also known as Alpha Carine, also known as Hans in Janub. Hans is, I believe, Egyptian. So you have Lunus, an Egyptian deity known as Hans Lunus, Lunus meaning moon, represented as hawk-headed hawk -headed, with a hawk's head, surmounted by the crescent and the disc. So now I have an Egyptian god called Lunus, the moon, with a crescent and disc. Lustration, a religious rite practiced by the ancients, it consisted in washing the hands and sometimes the whole body in consecrated water. It was a symbol of the internal purification of the heart, a ceremony preparatory to the, to the initiation in the ancient mysteries. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Muhammad was cut open by an angel, and they washed his heart in sacred water of Zamzam. Yep. 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 This yep. is an allegory. It's a symbolic mention that Muhammad was washed. This is lustration. This is an Egyptian practice. Okay. The ceremony is practiced with the same symbolic import in the high degrees of Freemasonry. So in other words, Muhammad was initiated into the sacred mysteries, the Egyptian sacred mysteries. That's the that's what they're trying to tell you here. Okay. And they, they mentioned the southern star Canopus in the case of the temple of Hans. Okay. And then I mentioned here Mut and then Osiris, Hans and Canopus. And they mentioned Min, Min, interesting, Min for heretic. Okay, the Jewish term. And, they, and what you've got is, we may hazard the assertion that the mummy form marks a setting star as the horns and disc mark a rising one. So the horns and the disc, the crescent moon and the star mark a rising star. Mm. So now you've got the symbolism that goes back to the dawn of astronomy, a study of the temple worship and mythology of the ancient Egyptians. Yeah. And there is a connection between masonry and Egyptology or the... Yes. worship of the in egypt and now are you seeing what he's showing you that in the story of muhammad having his chest cut open and having this black spot from his heart cleansed by sacred water zemzem that's a tradition in the islamic sources this has affinities with lustration you see that practice where the egyptians would take sacred water and wash their hands or their body as a sign of purifying their heart and you also find similar practice in the Muslims doing wudu, ritual ablution. And the Masons take that as all being connected. Keep right. that in mind. And now we mentioned Canopus, that the, the Kaaba is aligned to face Canopus, and Canopus was part of the Egyptian pagan religion. It was part of go. the sacred religion, right? And the horns and the disc is a rising star. So this is the rising star, okay? So this is you got this is Gerald Hawkins and David A. King, okay, the setting point of the three stars with the handle of the plow. So what you've got is the Kaaba is arranged as follow, follows. This side is towards the summer sunrise. This is the th three stars of the handle of the plow. This side of the Kaaba is the rising point of Canopus, the door of the Kaaba and the and the silver magudi here, the Vijay is here in this corner, and this is facing the winter sunset. That's how the Kaaba is arranged. And of course, they're also arranged on the four winds. So there's a meteorological element here. These are also arranged on the four winds. Okay. And um, yeah, so author, I'm going to skip this bit. Okay. Author Jean Duress had written in the secret books of the Egyptian Gnostics. Seth is known in Islam and usually assimilated to Agatho Daemon, who's one of the great figures of Hermetic literature. The prophetic prestige with which the Gnostics endowed him, he still possesses, especially in the traditions of various Shiite groups, therefore chiefly in Mesopotamia or in Iran. In these particular doctrines, the survival of Gnostic themes are ubiquitous and immense. In other words, the Egyptian hermetic Gnostic themes, the secret religion of the Egyptians, is maintained inside Islam, especially within Shia religion. This doesn't mean it's not in the Sunnis. They just keep quiet about it. But she's telling us here, that the secret books, um, they still have this, in other words. So you see that guy, right? The sources confirm Islam has preserved these ancient satanic 
Luciferian, pagan, myths, practices, idolatry, you name it, Gnosticism, Egypt, all of it combined and preserved by Satan through Islam and its various mutations. There you go. So that's the plan for you. Yeah, and I'm trying to finish it. Okay, fine. Good luck. Okay. Yeah, I've misnumbered my slides. Okay, let me finish up. And so such passages may well detail practice of the residents, residents of pagan Taif, 87 kilometers from Mecca, which I've been to. Uh, let me see. Okay, so basically, why is why these so there are two places, okay, outside of Mecca where you can get the same features, the same geography, the same the same vegetation, Taif. People mention Petra all the time, but Taif would qualify. And of course, I showed you Hiran in this in Yemen. They both qualify. Okay. So there's also 200 Amharic and Ethiopic loanwords in the Quran. Ask yourself, why are there hundreds of Ethiopic loanwords in the Quran? All right. So this would be something very, very strange. And of course, you'd expect to have more Coptic words if it was closer to Egypt. But what you have is also lots of Assyrian words. So you've got the the Assyrian words in the Quran, which obviously now indicates Syria and Turkey. And then you've got Amharic and Ethiopic words, which indicates the South, Yemen, right? And of course, you've got, it says here, if the Quran's early surahs were addressed to the inhabitants of Petra, one might expect more Coptic than Amharic and Ethiopic loanwords, since Nabatea was much closer culturally to Egypt than to Ethiopia. Yet Amharic and Ethiopic words in the Quran stand in a 20 to 1 ratio to Coptic words. So they were addressing this to people in the south, Yemen, because that's where the Ethiopic influence was. And of course, you've got the Syriac, right, as well, which now is talking about eastern Syria. And that's the Turkish connection. And again, you go back to Mesopotamia, you go back to paganism. And I think I'll end it here, Sam. Wow. What a nice image. Where'd you get this from? I made it with an AI. <laughs> Wow, that's a nice image. Wow. That's, I mean, sad that the moon is worshipped as a god uh, because the moon is beautiful. God's creation is beautiful, reflecting his beauty. But glory to God. This is now the finale, guys. It's five parts. You have my permission to take these videos. Obviously, it's his material. He can upload it to his channel. You have my permission to take the videos, upload them to your channels, clip them. But here's what you're going to do. The link to his YouTube channel is in the description box. He's got a lot more information because he's done a lot more talks on various channels. He's done some talks with Reason Answers. He actually did one recently on child pedophilia in Islam and how grotesque and wicked and evil it is. Go to his YouTube channel, subscribe, watch his videos, pray for him, his family, for his protection and health, and support him financially. Lord willing, he's going to come back and do other series, and it's up to him what's the next series he wants to do. We're going to try, like I said, keep it on thursdays but things happen my schedule sometimes doesn't allow it sometimes this schedule will change we'll try to be flexible he doesn't charge he didn't tell me look i'm only going to come to your channel if you give me x amount of dollars so that means the laborer is worthy of his wages there are a lot of people that will ask you for a speaker's fee i know i know people that know big names sometimes wow. they ask you have to have at least a thousand subscribers before they even come to your channel or they'll ask for a fee. And if they're talking in churches, some will even demand $5,000 to $10,000. That's why they only speak in mega churches. He didn't ask a penny from me. And if he did, he'd be in sad shape because both him and I <laughs> were not rich and I'm in full-time ministry. But how do you thank the Lord Jesus for these laborers? Matthew 10, 10, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Subscribe, watch his videos, spread them. Study the material, understand them, absorb them, share them, and give credit where credit is due. Do not steal his material. And not only pray, but support him financially. And invite him to your channels. Invite him, you who have YouTube channels. You. Let him come and do another series for your channel, like he did for me. This is how we keep these men and women in ministry who love the Lord, who are not doing it for money. He's one of them. Salma Dakdok is another, and I have a few others. So that's how you bless this man. Any final words on your part? And then we'll talk behind the scenes. Lord willing, what yeah. the next series will be. Oh, no, thank you, Sam. I really appreciate all the support. I mean, really, I, I'm blessed. And I, I thank you and everyone who's, who's supported me. I could not have done this without all of you. So thank you. Um, I'm just very humbled. Uh, Sam, can I spend a minute just showing people the stuff that I mentioned earlier? But, um, yeah, this. Um, this is Suleiman the Magnificent. 
he invaded 15 European states. Okay. And I just want to mention, this is something I've been working on recently. So the Protestant princes of German states received funds from Suleiman the Magnificent in their efforts to establish Lutheranism in Germany in 1555. This date is also of significance to Calvin, that specific date. Many historians note that Protestantism would never have succeeded in Europe without Suleiman's support. Emphasize that. Offer his help to Lutheran princes from the Netherlands. He said, I will send you an army whenever you need it, when you decide to go and fight the Catholics. Daniel Goffman, American professor of history, claims that the major factor for the expansion of Lutheranism were the Ottomans. They directly encouraged Protestantism, as in Northern Hungary and Transylvania, where Calvino Turkism, where Calvinism was known as Calvino Turkism, became the main religion. The French Calvinists argued that an alliance with the Ottomans must be used against Catholic Spain, when the Ottomans knew that by encouraging Protestantism, they would force the Habsburg to divide their forces. Thus, the Turks and the Protestants of the 16th century probably saved one another. Now, brother, right. emphasize and, that part. Many yes. historians, you had that clip, yes. many historians teach, and it was off the screen, so I can't recall it, but many historians teach that without Suleiman's financial support, as well as promising that, to help them militarily, there would be no Protestantism. So you saw that yeah. quote? I wanted them to emphasize it, but he's he's off to another screen. So what does that and I, say? And I linked to a paper on that as well. Okay. So notice they mentioned, this is another paper. This is from Romania or Hungary. Calvino Turkism. Okay. A bizarre connection between East and West, between Islam and Christianity. Right. And they speak here of this. And they, there were four accepted religions. Lutheranism, Calvinism, Catholicism, and Unitarianism, which is Protestant, but it is anti-Christian because it's against the Trinity. Then they speak of here... Calvino Turkism. Notice, okay, so Calvino Turkism refers to the approach of Transylvania towards the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. Okay, and they speak of also Anabaptismo Turkism due to the relations between Islam and radical religions that were tolerated. Now, let's have a look at what do they mean by, let's pick an example. These are religious beliefs and practices that deviate significantly from mainstream or traditional views. Now, scholars will say, well, you know, this area was religiously pluralist. You know, they were tolerant of religions. Let's see what they were tolerant of, okay? For example, Jacobus Paleologus, a Catholic who became radicalized in the anti-Trinitarian movement, the Unitarians, he sought to simplify Christianity in a way that resonated more with Islam and Judaism, right? They mean Islam here. Creating a syncretic religion formula called universal religion. He believed that being a Muslim did not exclude one from salvation. He proposed a minimalist creed that imitated the Islamic Shahada. Paleologus' views were considered radical and heretical, and his influence on the Unitarians, blah, blah. But notice that he wanted Christianity to not differ from Islam. So the movement was influenced by the Protestantism of John Calvin, and the religious practices of the Ottoman Empire. The movement aimed to simplify Christianity and eliminate dogmas that contravened Islam and Judaism in order to produce a form of ecumenism. So, so understand he wanted, so this was considered acceptable, apparently. This was apparently considered acceptable. So he wanted to change Christianity to be, let's just say, closer to Islam and have a shahada that was closer to Islam and this was the kind of thing that was tolerated and promoted in that region at the time. So your, your thoughts on that, Sam? I want you Protestants to see your history. Your history is directly tied in with Muslims who hate the Trinity, who wanted to destroy the Catholic Church. This is your heritage. This is your history. This is as far as you can trace yourself. I thank the Lord Jesus I'm no longer a Protestant. But if you're a Protestant, I don't mean to insult you or make you feel bad, but you should be ashamed of your history. You should hate Calvin, Martin Luther, and these other deformers the way you hate Muhammad. Because how can you call them Christian when they are teaming up with the Ottomans and taking the money of the Ottomans and even willing to take military aid from the Ottomans who are Muslims? to destroy the Catholic Church that loves and worships the Trine God. Your history is evil. It is ugly. It's disgusting. Protestantism has blood on her hands because of their wicked union with the Turks. Shame on Protestantism. I didn't know this when I was a Protestant. 
you know, someone asks, is there, <laughs> this? it is finished, says, does the history show any ties to Catholicism? Uh, yes, it does, because without the Catholics fighting the Crusades, you'd be praying with your ass in the air to Allah today. If you live in Europe. <laughs> Say that so again. That's the tie to that's the tie to Catholicism. You need to thank a Catholic today, if I were you. One more time, say that. You need to thank a Catholic today for not being a Muslim if you live in Europe. And remember, you're not saying it as a Catholic. You're not a yeah. you know, you said what's no, your no, no, no. <laughs> I'm an Anglican Protestant, but but um, but oh look, another thing I can mention, for instance, um, what people don't realize is that if you look at I mean there's okay so what i've been researching is of course everyone knows about 1683 the battle of vienna the, the turkish um under jan sobieski the poles under jan sobieski had with an army of eighty thousand faced an army of three hundred thousand turks okay an army three times larger than they had and defeated them right and it took them another 16 years to kick the turks out of europe right however few people realize that the hungarian protestants were the ones who apparently according to the research what i'm fighting what i'm learning is they invited the Turks in. That invasion of Europe was invited by either the Romanians or the Hungarians. They actually brought them in. And if if Vienna had fallen, right, the Turks were going to go to Rome and Europe would have been Islamized completely because nothing would have stopped them then. So the Turks were stopped by the Catholic Poles and the Germans who fought against them. So so in other words, the, this pro what the Protestants were doing was effectively aiding and abetting Islam in a real sense. Disgusting. Uh, the more I learned, when I found out about it through Walid and Theodore Shobat initially, because I didn't know anything about Protestant history, and he's confirming it, and Lord willing, he'll be doing theories on it, and he'll do it even on my channel. I am ashamed of Protestantism. How dare you side with the Ottoman Islamic Empire that hates the triune God in order to destroy the Catholic Church, which loves and worships the triune God. You would side with a Mohammedan who blasphemes the real Jesus against a Trinitarian who loves and worships Jesus Christ as God in flesh. Shame on you. That's why hundreds of thousands, if not millions, are seeing Protestantism for what it is, and they hate it, and they're returning to the ancient paths. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that happens more, and I pray God will use you. And when you're ready with that series, come here and share it with us. So any final comments? We'll wrap up. No, that's it. I mean, we, we'll pick another topic next. So you feel free to pick a topic. I mean, atheism might be interesting because sure. atheism is the stupidest ideology on the face of the planet. And I'd love to talk about it. That's history. All right. Then that next series will be Atheism by the Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Unless you wanted to talk about the Sharia and child kitty. Oh, yeah, kitty yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Let's do Sharia and child pedophilia. Yeah, that's like one episode. We can cover that. That's no problem. Okay. So next session, God willing, next series how Muhammad is a pedophile bastard, a whore, burning in hell, and the abuse of children. And it's going to get graphic. It's going to break your heart. It's going to make you hate Muhammad even more because you can't hate that pervert enough. Glory to Jesus Christ. So, brethren, go to his YouTube channel. Subscribe, support, pray, and invite him to your channels. And God willing, guys, don't forget, a little later, 7.30 p.m., New York time, 7.30 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, Michigan time, I'm going to try to finish the finale on biblical overview of hell. So join me, pray for me. Spirit will anoint mm -hmm. me to speak clear without error for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. With that said, we're signing off. I'll see you in a few hours if the Lord Jesus wills. There's the link. Lord bless you. Lord preserve you. May be filled with the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.